wouldn't do the needful with the electronic devices. Um, now would be the time to declare any financial or other related interests to today's business. If there are none, then we shall proceed. If members are content, the oral evidence sessions on the damages return investment bill and the protection from stocking bill will be reported um, by Hansard. Uh, I will suspend the meeting after the oral evidence session with La Dolce Vita. Um, that will be for the short lunch break. So once we get through that evidence session, um, we will then uh, break for lunch. Uh, there's apologies from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan. Rachel Woods is joining the, the afternoon session. And I think, Gemma, you'll um, be absent just uh, between half one and three. So we are joined then by Linda, Doug, Paul Fru, Shania Bradley and Gemma via the Starley facility. And if the clerk can advise if any delegation of votes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to Paul Given, the Chairman, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Um, Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to Linda Dillon during her absence um, and during the meeting. Okay, thank you. The draft minutes then of the meeting that was held on the 20th of May. There's just a minor typographical error in the minutes. That's at page 13. The date and the second agreed action from agenda item 12 on the DOJ budget should read 22 2020-21 rather than 21-22. So that's just a, a slight amendment. If members then are content with the uh, minutes uh, subject to that alteration, then I will sign them accordingly. Agreed? Okay, thank you. Um, some matters are rising then. The Department has responded to the Committee's request for an update on engagement with the Department of Finance on the issues of costs relating to the damages bill and if the Treasury will provide access to the reserve. The relevant correspondence is pages 18 to 20 of the meeting pack. And the Department has advised that officials are not aware of any engagement with um, DOF officials specifically on the issue of costs other than the potential costs for the Department of Justice, but there has been engagement more generally in relation to the Bill, and the Justice Minister raised the issue of wider costs with executive colleagues at the time of introduction of the legislation. And they also understand that the Department of Finance officials are currently seeking further information from departments on the financial implications of changes to the discount rate before continuing further negotiations with Treasury regarding access um, to the uh, reserve. So, if members are content, we will note uh, that updated uh, position. Um, the response will be added to the electronic uh, bill folder. In terms of uh, an update on the Committee Forward Work Programme, um, it takes us up to the summer recess and it just reflects the work items that were agreed at our meeting uh, last uh, week. Uh, the Business Committee, uh, members will have seen, has agreed that the Assembly summer recess will commence on the 10th of July. Therefore, the last committee meeting before recess uh, will be on Thursday, the 8th of July, and that will be added to uh, the work programme. So that takes us into item four on the agenda then. is It's the damages return off investment bill and our first um, of the oral evidence session. So there is a paper uh, which sets out issues that uh, members may wish to explore during these next three oral evidence sessions on this particular bill. It was circulated yesterday. It's in pages three to five of the tabled pack. So we have representatives from the Health and Social Care NI, which includes the five main health trusts. They're joining us via the Starleaf um, facility. Um, the uh, written submission from the Health and Social Care Board is in your meeting pack, pages 29 to 32. So hopefully I am able to uh, welcome um, Mr McGuinness, Chief Legal Advisor, and Mr Harvey, Assistant Chief Legal Advisor from the Health and Social Care um, Board. Um, you're welcome uh, to the Justice Committee. We will report this by Hansard, and then a transcript will be published on our committee webpage in due course. So I'm going to, to hand over to yourselves at this stage to give us a an outline of some of the key issues, and then we will pick it up with some questions. So, thank you. Good morning, Chairman, and thank you very much. Um, Alton McGuinness is my name, and, and Mark Harvey uh, is, is with me. So, good, good to see you, Chairman. Uh, pity we can't be there in person, but that we continue with, with Zoom. Just explain, perhaps, uh, initially uh, who we are. Uh, we, we're part of the Directorate of Legal Services. Um, and we are the sole provider of legal service to the health and social care sector uh, in Northern Ireland. 
and um, we try to provide a broad range of, of, of legal services, we won't go through them all obviously, but including clinical negligence, which is probably most uh, germane to what uh, we're discussing this morning. And, and we deal with a, a, a very large number, a significant number of clinical negligence and indeed other litigation claims on behalf of the five large health trusts, the geographical trusts, the ambulance service and the health and social care board. Um, the values of those claims range from maybe £1,000 to, to, to several million, even into tens of millions of pounds, and include really complex, um, high-value cases, uh, particularly uh, relating to children or, or birth injuries, um, uh, and where compensation is, is claimed as, as a consequence of, that, of, of such injuries. So, I mean, our, our view, and, and I think the legal profession view is uh, that there is a reasonable compensation for patients who are harmed due to clinical negligence, but there's, there's a balancing act, and I, I think that's one of the, the key messages we want to give to you this morning, that there's a balance between the, the, the legitimate rights of plaintiffs, of course, they have right to, to get proper and adequate compensation, and, and the, the ability to, to pay, the compensator's ability to pay. In our case, it's the health and social care system. Um, so it's public funds that, that are that are used to to uh, pay the damages. Um, Mark is going to uh, go through uh, some examples of cases for, for your benefit. Hopefully, will will we'll help you in, in understanding our position. Okay. Thanks, Alfie. Um... Good morning, uh, Chairman and, and members of the committee. Uh, and thank you for inviting us along this morning to, to discuss this important issue. Um, as Alfie says, the Director of Legal Services represents the, the HSE sector in Northern Ireland and the area which I focus on, uh, and I manage a team of solicitors who specialise in the clinical negligence claims and inquests on behalf of our HSE clients. Th those cases, as Alfie says, uh, range in value from um, small amounts of money uh, hundreds or a thousand pounds, right up to tens of millions of pounds for the, for the most highly complex and high value cases in Northern Ireland. Um, those cases include um, failure to diagnose, misdiagnosis, um, alleged surgical errors, complications, issues regarding consent to treatment and, and birth injury claims. And it's those latter cases which represent by far the most complex, sensitive and, and high value of the cases we see. Um, and the position since 2017 has largely been a holding pattern. Um, obviously, uh, England and Wales and Scotland moved to alter their discount rates um, from 2017 and went through subsequent change in, in 2019. Um, and the position didn't alter here in Northern Ireland. Um, in order to address, I suppose, the inherent unfairness of this situation uh, for plaintiffs, particularly severely disabled children and persons under a disability, and with the agreement of our clients and the approval of the court, we have been entering into some interim settlements with review clauses in appropriate cases, ensuring that plaintiffs receive an interim award of compensation with a balance in payment within a defined period of time once the discount rate issue was resolved. Obviously, it wasn't envisaged in 2017 that it would be some four years before the rate was revised, or at least five years before a new mechanism for setting the rate would be in place. This has meant that we've essentially been in a holding pattern since then with interim payments and incomplete settlements, uncertainty and instability. So the lack of a settled position with regard to the rate has created uncertainty, not just for, for defendants, but also for plaintiffs. The move to minus 1.75% from the 31st of May will not resolve this uncertainty as it's rightly viewed by defendants as an interim rate. Um, it will soon be replaced by a longer term rate, hopefully in early 2022. In the interim, however, it's important that the committee is aware that cases may be difficult to resolve, as some defendants may stall cases, refuse to engage on the basis of such an unrealistic rate, or there may continue to be compromised settlements due to disagreements over the rate. In addition, uh, in appropriate cases, our clients will wish to consider interim settlements again as a holding position pending implementation of a longer term settled rate. This is going to inevitably lead to delays, increased costs and contested court hearings. We note the comments of the Lord Chief Justice in his submission to the committee that while courts should not be expected to approve settlements which undercompensate plaintiffs, 
Neither should they be expected to approve settlements which place an undue burden on the taxpayer who ultimately bear the cost of overcompensation if awarded against defendants. One of the defendants most impacted by the rate change in Northern Ireland is undoubtedly the health service and our clients. The imminent change represents a dramatic move from the outmoded rate of 2.5%, and this new rate, in our view, swings the pendulum away from undercompensation to what can only be viewed as extreme overcompensation. And each of these rates is unsustainable because, as pointed out by others, they are extremes. We acknowledge the committee can't alter or set the rate and is only considering the legal framework. However, we wish to voice our concern on behalf of our HSC clients that despite the best efforts of the committee, to press ahead with plans to introduce a bill containing a new, a new mechanism for setting the rate, if for any reason the passage of this bill is delayed or unsuccessful, the planned rate of minus 1.75% from the 31st of May will become an indefinite rather than an interim rate, leading to a massive increase in compensation payouts and clinical negligence claims against the health service and significant pressure on the health budget. It is difficult, incredibly difficult, I would say, to accurately forecast the financial increase impact of the discount rate change to minus 1.75%. However, we did carry out some work with the assistance of a forensic accountant last year, assessing a sample of our claims with a value over a defined limit and estimated the increase in the value of current claims in the region of anywhere between 40 to 136 million pounds additional compensation. Now, clearly the value of each case is difficult and challenging to predict because it's dependent on a number of factors, the medical evidence, the accountancy reports, the life expectancy of the plaintiff, and the level of future loss claims, and a number of other factors. But it's important that the committee recognise this is money that in the context of a health service slowly emerging from a pandemic, this could be spent on waiting lists and frontline services. Every case we deal with has a future loss element well, I'm sorry, every case we deal with which has a future loss element will be impacted by this rate change. And the most significant of these cases will be birth injury claims. And the figures could be staggering. And it's important that I draw out an example for the benefit of the committee, which is contained within my submission response on behalf of the HSC. But we do have experience of a recent case with a claim settlement of £9 million under the old rate would translate into a settlement of £35 million at the proposed new rate of minus 1.75%. This will be a total increase of £26 million for one plaintiff. The gap then between the new rate for Northern Ireland against the rest of the UK creates a stark difference, which has implications for the health budget. And you'll note in my submissions, I, I provided a table which starkly um, illustrated the difference between the rates across England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and how this is going to impact the health service cases. The timing of this could obviously hard to be worse um, after such um, immensely challenging um, times in the fight against COVID-19 over the last 12 months. The HSC faces significant financial pressures um, due to this latest decision um, on the personal injury discount rate. So from our perspective, we believe that from the 31st of May, we're facing further uncertainty in creating adequate reserves against present and potential future claims. And the large difference of 26 million illustrated in that one case between the present discount rate and the proposed rate further emphasizes the potential for compensation to many plaintiffs and the resultant ramifications for public funds. One safeguard that we have been strongly advocating against overcompensation will be to ensure that these cases are settled by means of what is called a periodical payment order with as many heads of claim or compensation as possible being paid to the plaintiff on an annual basis, thus reducing the need for a lump sum payment calculated using multipliers and discount rates, thereby removing a lot of this uncertainty. In the highest value claims we deal with, um, injuries suffered at birth, for example, we would positively encourage uh, the department to strengthen the provisions in the Damages Act dealing with PPOs so that plaintiffs are required to accept our offers of PPOs for future loss rather than being able to argue before the court for lump sums. This approach would depend on plaintiffs in the courts being satisfied that the defendant would be in a position to meet the payments going forward. But health trusts would be in a position to give this guarantee 
In this jurisdiction, the vast majority of these high value cases involve health trusts as defendants, and therefore the solution to this problem should take into account that in most cases, the defendant will be a public body who will be in a position to meet future PPO liabilities, and therefore the solution to the uncertainty of future investment return and inflation of rates involves taking that uncertainty out of the equation and enforcing settlement of future cost claims by way of PPO. So in summary, um, I would strongly um, encourage the committee to consider the timeliness of passage of this bill and the importance of this bill in terms of introducing it and removing the uncertainty and instability that has existed since 2017. Because if the situation were to continue, the financial impact of a rate change to minus 1.75 will, will be stark and will have a massive uh, significant increase or see a significant increase in the value of claims, clinical negligence claims against the health service uh, at a time when that money would be better spent elsewhere. Uh, I recognise at this point there needs to be balance and we agree that uh, it, it is important that there's reasonable compensation for patients who are harmed due to clinical negligence, but this must be balanced against the compensator's ability to pay. To pay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I probably don't want to get into uh, a debate around the, the, the current interim rate, to be honest. Um, I want to focus on this new framework. I think we've been told by the Justice Minister that we have to be absolutely blind to the financial consequences uh, for whether it's the health service or indeed any other body. It's about having a framework that ensures the 100% compensation principle. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the Justice Minister's view on that, but that is what she has told this committee that it's not for us to take into account the financial impact on the health service or indeed any other um, body. Uh, and um, That interim rate was consulted upon. The government actuaries approved it. Um, uh, and I, I hope the health service aren't going to now sit on claims in the hope for this new framework to try and come up with a, a different rate as a reason for stalling, because um, a lot of the public bodies actually have been undercompensating people based upon the old rate before this interim rate took place. But I think, to be honest, that is a secondary issue for the committee. But what, what I am interested in is your views on what the new framework um, would look like. Um, uh, and is there a, a view there that, based on the Scottish model, um, there's a couple of slight changes to, to the Northern Ireland framework, rather than taking a 30-year calculation for payment the, which the Scottish model uses. The uh, Northern Ireland proposal from DOJ is to take a 40-year perspective for that and um, also uh, it removes uh, ministerial involvement in the decision-making process so it goes out to um, an entirely independent body if there is ever such a thing as an entirely independent body um, but ultimately there would be no recourse to a minister um, to amend or strike a different rate if, if that is what the new body comes up with. Um, so I'd be keen to know what your view is on the proposed um, new framework uh, and does that build in, um, which the Scottish model does, a scenario where there, there never would be undercompensation. They, they, they have a policy in place to ensure that there is never the potential of undercompensation. If you could address one point, um, Chairman, and thank you for those remarks. In, in relation to the fear of the, the, the Chairman and the committee that the health service would somehow seek to stall cases, uh, I can assure the committee and reassure you, um, as you'll hear from my opening remarks, that HSC clients who we represent have come up with creative and innovative solutions since 2017 to, to address the inherent unfairness of the situation for plaintiffs, and that is why we have been dealing with interim settlements um, by way of paying compensation to plaintiffs on an interim basis under an old outdated rate which has been largely ignored um, in the insurance industry in terms of negotiated claims that they deal with. But uh, we have addressed that unfairness by agreeing solutions with plaintiffs and the courts which have largely addressed that, that problem because it has been recognised for some time now that the, the um, the rate needed to change, and um, it hadn't done so since 2001. Uh, and I feel that we and our clients have very much stepped up to the mark and dealt with that and addressed that issue, Chairman, if that's of assistance. In the next 12 to 18 months, 
Um, obviously, our clients need to review the position in relation to the new rate, which kicks in on the 31st of May, uh, and further consideration needs to be given as to how cases will be dealt with. But uh, I can say that both DLS and our clients um, will approach that in a fair uh, and balanced way. Chair, could I add, Chairman, as well, I mean, going back to this, I suppose, the issue of Mark raised, the general issue of certainty or stability, and uh, for the last four years, it's, it's been uncertain and unstable, and and you know we, we welcome the, the fact that you're, you're bringing forward the, the bill and and uh, the timeliness, timeliness timeliness of the act itself that would be crucial in bringing certainty back to the situation because you, you're, you're right in the sense that people can take advantage of the fact that it's not helpful for them to settle now, and it may not be helpful to settle when there's an interim rate in place. So everyone hangs around and waits for the certainty that, that, that comes with the legislation. And I think that um, speaks more to uh, ensuring that this act is put in place just as soon as, as, as is reasonably possible um, to offset some of those um, uh, disadvantages and, and uh, potential uh, discrepancies in, in, in the current arrangements and, and in, in trying to resolve cases. It, it does make it much more difficult, I can assure you. So you, you, you mentioned a specific point of the 43 years. Um, I mean, we, we, we agree with, with the, 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 the 43 years investment period is objective, it's backed up by evidence. Um, I believe from the Association of, of British Insurers uh, that, <coughs> that, that concluded the average investment period uh, was 46 years, so 40, 43 years errors on the side of caution. So we've no difficulty with that aspect of it. it, 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 it not your particular question to us, uh, but the more general issue is, is, is securing the stability that I previously referred to. One of the other points, um, Mr. Chairman, you, you, you had kind of asked for our views on was the um, the advantages or disadvantages of transferring responsibility for setting the rates from the Department of Justice to the Government Actuary. Uh, we strongly believe that this is a matter of public policy, Mr. Chairman, and as such, we believe the responsibility for setting the discount rate should remain with the Minister for Justice rather than the Government Actuary. Um, and therefore, we believe that we should adopt the England and Wales model um, with parliamentary scrutiny. But to go further uh, and to build in consultation with experts such as economists and financial advisors uh, and representatives for claimants and compensators um, to get a more rounded picture of the wider societal impact of a discount rate change um, rather than an actuarial exercise which is carried out independent of political scrutiny. Okay. Yeah, and that, that, that's a very live issue, I think, in terms of what the new legal framework would look like. Um, so that, that's helpful, and thank you for that. Let me bring in a couple of other members. I, I'll come back to some questions if they don't pick it up, but in the first instance, I'll Linda Dillon and then Shania Bradley. Linda, if you want to come in. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alfie and Mark, for their presentation. Um, I just have one quick question based on, on some of the issues that you've raised. Of the periodical payments, I don't disagree with. I think that that probably, um, to me, makes sense, particularly where you have injuries to a baby, because that ensures that for their whole lifetime, they will actually be looked after and are not, are not relying on, on maybe, I suppose, sensible um, decisions to be taken on their behalf that, that they actually will be looked after for their lifetime so I probably can see the, the sense in that I'm just wondering that's fine in terms of a public body and you can have some sense of security that you'll you'll you know you'll always have that and the periodical payments will never be broken but where it's a business um, or an insurance company and I'm just wondering chair how, how would that work because how would you have that sense of security? Is there the potential that the periodical payments could end if the insurance company, for example, was to, to be dissolved for whatever reason, or the business that uh, were responsible? Now, I'm assuming the business part doesn't come into it because you would like to think that their insurance company are, are paying for it. But what happens if something happens in terms of that insurance company? 
Yeah. Well, yeah, obviously, you're right that 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 there there, there are, are issues there. I, I, I don't know if it's being underwritten by uh, government, but uh, if, if, if there were any uh, difficulties with the insurance company, um, if if the business were to go bust or some uh, people are uninsured, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that frequent an occurrence. But if they are uninsured, then it's out of their own pockets, and and they wouldn't have they would they wouldn't be the affordable affordability. Um, uh, I, I, mean, I think it's a question for the insurance uh, market as, as to how they would uh, address them. Uh, Chairman, and I, it's, it's, I suppose we're here as representatives of, of the health of our clients, the health and social care system, uh, and I suppose as, as an accept fully what you, you, you say, uh, you, you can be, be assured that, that any Commitments will be honoured for the duration of the life of the, the, the child or, or baby or whoever the plaintiff happens to be. I think it, it's a fair point because when it comes to our clients, obviously we advocate the use of PPOs um, because they do create fairness and balance. Um, for example, if the plaintiff sadly dies early um, in a lump sum um, situation, the vast lump sum goes into the estate, which isn't what the money was intended for. But the risk of huge lump sum awards risks undercompensation if it's not invested wisely. So it's limited to predictions of life expectancy, whereas PPOs take away that risk. Um, and in addition, a, a plaintiff can obviously exceed their life expectancy, and they have the security to know that the PPO gives them coverage for su such circumstances. Our difficulty is, um, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that at minus 1.75% from the 31st of May, some plaintiff advisors are invariably going to push more and more of these settlements into lump sum arrangements, and we will face opposition to periodical payment order and uh, an attempt to agree periodical payment orders. And going back to the point about the insurance cases, um, I, I would be fair to say that we um, agree much more PPOs than, than the insurance, insurance industry, and they can speak to this point. But I do know from discussions with um, insurance industry representatives that their clients tend to favour uh, an approach with a lump sum because it gives them certainty um, and gets the claim off the books, so to speak, um, whereas our clients can give those assurances for many years into the future that any liabilities will be met. So I, I think it is a difficult issue that, that needs to be grappled with. Yeah, and I'm not sure that we can grapple with it within the bill for that reason, that how would you, how would you manage that within legislation that absolutely... We should insist on the periodical payment orders within public bodies, but not within the private insurance. I'm just not sure how you would do that within legislation, but I'm not saying that there isn't some way around it, but it may potentially be a, a policy or regulation um, issue rather than on the face of the legislation. And I, I, I just wanted to, I suppose, flesh out if, if, there was, if you could see how it could be done, um, given that that was a suggestion. So... As I say, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to them. I think that they are a sensible approach um, and do give some reassurance, particularly in those cases where it's lifelong. Chair, I think that's really the, the only question. Uh, just to make the point and um, around the one uh, 1.75, that interim rate that's coming in, um, we have made the point as a committee, and I certainly have made it repeatedly, that we need to get this legislation and this framework set on the books as quickly as possible because I absolutely accept what you're saying and whilst we do have to look at the framework and not at the impact on um, you know on, on public bodies or anything else we're, we're elected to an assembly that has responsibility for, for the health service and the conversations over the last couple of days will tell us where we want our money to be going so I mean, we, we are conscious of it, you know, as much as you might say, we have to look at the framework and that's what has to matter to us. The health service matters to us and, and how we service everybody in our communities, you know, including those who have lifelong injuries and need to be compensated. But obviously also there, there are major issues within the health service and we don't want money to be going where it shouldn't be going either. So we are, we are conscious of that. And for my part, and I'm sure other members of the committee will agree we need to get this through as quickly as possible and we will get it through as quickly as possible just to give you that reassurance. There's nothing we can do, unfortunately, about the interim rate. Um, the Minister took that decision, which you took it based on 
uh, legal case that was being brought against her. So it, it wasn't, I suppose, the, the first choice of, of well, the I'll just share that it's going to get through as quickly as possible. I think that's what, what uh, is needed to bring back that certainty. Thank yeah, you. I, I absolutely agree with you. Chair, sure, that's, that's me for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Linda. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, just thanks to Alfie and Mark firstly, and I have to say at the outset that um, I was really pleased to hear about the interaction you've had about setting interim payments, although they're incomplete. I know uh, myself and Doug Beatty, a committee, have been chasing this in particular because whilst we're all eager to get this to a final place, you know, it's the here and now for some people and those interim payments, albeit that they're not complete, will be life-changing, no doubt, for people who, who need that help. So I, I really do commend you in doing that and encourage that. Um, and I would encourage any piece from the department to make sure that any person unfortunate enough to be caught up in this through no fault of their own is aware that that, that is always on the table um, while, while we're working our way through that. So I, I think that's an important piece to start off with. Um, following on from where Linda was, I was going to ask the question about, you know, making that distinction between the settlements against a public body as opposed to perhaps the private sector. And you're, you're absolutely right, um, Mark, you made the reference there that, you know, there's uncertainties there. You know, if you're um, the recipient of, of such a payment, there would be a, a reasonable nervousness about um, will the body, that party that I'm claiming against, be there in future years to honour those payments? And of course, in a public body scenario, um, there's a lot of reassurance that they will be there in some form or format or name might change, but they're ultimately going to be there. So there is that distinction, I think. But, um, and, I, and I know Linda did try to, to do, dwell in that, and I'm just wondering, um, is there a place or where would you anticipate that setting in terms of, do you see that as a piece of legislation where you would make the distinction or can you work down at regulation level? Um, I just wasn't clear. I, you're very clear in your idea, but I wasn't clear about your proposal in terms of where you think that might sit. And I wondered also if you had any examples of where that's used anywhere, you know, in any other part of the, the globe. Um, there may be examples similar to that that we could draw on. Um, and the other point, I'll just make it while I'm on, in terms of the the nuance between GAD, you know, the actuaries. So ultimately, there, there is this um, grey area between we're being told that the framework's there, but ultimately the government actuaries are targeted with hitting that 100%. And yet then your preference to the other model where you feel there should be other stakeholders engaged in that process. Um, how can you, how do you see that other stakeholders add, you either hit the 100% or you don't. So I just would want to hear why you think stakeholders, you know, and I, and I mean stakeholders from across the whole, the plethora of this, um, how you think they add to hitting the 100% because you either hit it or you don't. Um, so I am concerned that the other processes, whilst I understand them, I don't see that there's a real added value in them. Um, but I, I just also want to put on record, I think it's in everybody's interest that we get this sorted to a permanent solution and, and we'll be playing our part in that. So thank you. I know throwing a bit there at you, but appreciate that. Well, uh, uh, you know, concur completely with you. Uh, uh, trying, everyone wants to get this sorted uh, as, as speedily as possible. I think with 100% compensation, it's just extraordinarily difficult to, to achieve what is 100% compensation. It, it's, you know, you'll have actuarial evidence, and that's fine, that helps. But why are there such distinctions in, 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 in the rates that have been struck? Uh, the distinctions in the rates between England and Wales on the one hand and Scotland on the other, and ourselves on the other hand, if you have three hands, but you, you know what I'm getting at. So, so it, it, it's uh, demonstrative of, of the fact that it is very difficult to, to strike uh, the, 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 the right rate. But I think, Mark, your point about bringing in other experts was um, to give more rounded 
uh, view of of uh, what what was payable and what uh, what ability there is to pay as well. Um, uh, you, you spoke of the insurance companies and the um, and, and businesses, private sector, if you like, and maybe the unreliability of, of paying PPOs into the future. But uh, that that is that is also a factor that needs to be brought into this whole uh, debate. Um, the ability of the compensator to actually pay. So it's it's it's, it's not just on actuarial grounds, but on on other factors that that need, that need to be uh, respected and, and and societal issues that that need to be introduced into any debate about what is truly one percent compensation. No, but, I mean, I agree with Alfie. I mean, why we obviously defer to the expertise of the government actuary, and this is their area, but it, it isn't an exact science. And a lot of what the work that they carry out are, are essentially actuarial stabs in the dark because we're trying to predict how to award or how to um, give due deference to the 100% compensation principle for a plaintiff who may suffer life-changing injuries and require, for example, a, a, an annual payment by virtue of a PPO for the next 40, 50, maybe 60 years in the case of a child with normal life expectancy. So it's incredibly challenging for any expert to, to um, ad adhere to the principle of 100% compensation when you're trying to predict the economic climate for many years to come. So our point about bringing in experts from other fields and representatives from wider society will be to seek to address that point and take on board other views, both representatives on behalf of claimants, defendants, um, economists, financial advisors, accountants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, England and Wales have gone some way to address that by uh, requiring that they actually consult with an expert group. We're, we're actually, um, and other defence representatives are advocating for a wider panel or group which could be brought to bear and, and bring their experience to this discussion and that ultimately then that's also subject to parliamentary debate and scrutiny and therefore accountability. Um, go, go and hope that addresses that point. The, the other issue that you'd asked was in relation to legislation and how could we deal with the um, mandated use of, of PPOs. And, and I suppose that goes back to the 1996 Damages Act and beefing up the provisions of the legislation to perhaps uh, mandate that plaintiffs accept the offer of PPOs in appropriate cases. Now, um, obviously, narrowly and selfishly, I, I'm thinking in terms of our health service clients and those really high-value cases involving tragic, catastrophic uh, brain injuries because of uh, issues, injuries sustained at birth. But those cases, whilst they're a small percentage of the claims that we deal with, they're by far the most expensive and high-value and, and take up the greatest and the, the lion's share of the, the health budget, as it were, in terms of the central fund for clinical negligence claims. It's roughly about two-thirds. So it's important that there's a solution um, discussed and devised which would seek to address that. And I think the only way to do that is to legislate for it, because I can foresee in, in, in the weeks ahead uh, and we have got several multi-million pound cases listed in the High Court before the end of June, in which we will face opposition from plaintiff representatives with a rate as low as it is now from the 31st of May, who will push for as much as possible to go into a lump sum, because we're talking about millions of pounds here. We had experience of, uh, and I gave one example, we've also had a recent case where uh, a balance of payment of four to 500,000 pounds suddenly rose to two million pounds because the payment is required to be made after the 31st of May. That's a stark illustration of the financial impact of this. So I accept the point that there are challenges ahead in terms of how you distinguish between private and public bodies and given assurances to plaintiffs that, that um, private bodies can, can make those payments. And I don't know how that's to be distinguished, but I think there's a conversation to be had and we'll be keen to be part of that conversation. The, the second issue that you raised was, uh, is there a, other examples from elsewhere? Well, there was some discussion in England and Wales in recent years uh, about legislating for courts to be able to order uh, PPOs. In Scotland, prior to the pandemic in 2019, um, they had legislation, which I understand has yet to be passed, which gives the courts power to order PPOs. Um, so I think there's already been some thought given to this uh, across the water, uh, and I think there's Possibly a regional discussion could be had as to how Northern Ireland could similarly tackle the issue of civil assistance. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Jerry, I won't talk. I'm, I'm hoping maybe somebody would be picking up on the GP um, 
situation as well, so I'll, I'll not talk about it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks to Mark and Alfie. Okay. Um, Gemma Dolan, please. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Mark and Alfie. And yeah, just as Sinead said there on the GPs, I'm just wondering why are GPs in the North the only ones responsible for uh, providing their own indemnity? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm actually not sure what the answer to that is, uh, Gemma, but uh, I, I, uh, they, they go through the BMA. Least they, they are indemnified uh, in the same way as a private clinician would be indemnified. So if you have an obstetrician doing private work, they, they have their own indemnity. It, it's different when they're working within the NHS, there's a distinction. So it's, it's, it, I, I understand it's, it's a very similar uh, arrangement. Um, I, I suppose uh, if you look at a hospital doctor, uh, they're employees of the trust. So under the principle of vicarious liability, the trust is the defendant in any uh, civil action, um, whereas the GP is named personally in, in, in those actions. So it's against that individual and therefore has to have a form of insurance of an indemnity. Uh, that, that they pay a premium for, and it's quite quite costly. I mean, I, I, I saw the the BMA's uh, response to the consultation. I think it was something like twelve to twenty thousand, wasn't it, uh, for some individuals? So it's, just, yeah. it's it's a quite quite a chunk out of out of their annual salary. Yeah. If it helps, Jim, as I understand it, in England they moved to change the system there, where, by as you say, it's a, there's an NHS indemnity for GPs, and they've they've come within the, the umbrella of the health service. Um, I'm not sure there've been similar discussions in Northern Ireland to, to bring them under the health service umbrella here, but certainly that's been the position adopted across the water. Um, but as Alfie says, and you've seen it from the submissions from from other. Uh, defence organisations and from the BMA, the, the increase in um, premiums, um, indemnity provision for GPs um, could as much as, as double, if not more, uh, for, for GP practices, which is going to be incredibly challenging from a financial perspective for them. We represent, um, obviously, I think we clear, we represent the health trusts as opposed to the general practitioners who are separately represented by, by their own legal providers. And I'm sure you'll be hearing from GP representatives on that issue. Through their indemnity organisations, the mm -hmm. representations. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, Linda, your hand up, but I'm not sure if that's from last, from the first no. instance. No. Yeah, I, sorry, it is up, Chair. Apologies. Yeah. Just a very quick question. Um, well, first of all, on the back of what Gemma just said, maybe we should write to the health minister as a committee and ask is that something that he is considering because obviously we we have a particular situation i'm not saying that it's not the same across these islands because it is but we have a particular challenge here in the north around gps and i certainly wouldn't want us to see us losing more gps because of an insurance issue and and i do think that we need to refocus some of our attention to the insurance companies they're making billions out of us out of us all and we shouldn't make claimants pay the price for what can sometimes be very greedy private insurance companies you know so i, I think that we we probably need to have a focus on that i just wanted to ask the question um of mark and alfie it's come back to that point around the difference between public bodies and, and private insurance companies. Is there a potential, and I may be way off the mark, it might be something that's possible, that that could be done via policy of the department? And, and is that something that we should ask, Chair, as a committee? Is that possible? And again, that, that would probably be a question to the health minister. Um, and, and Mark may be able to tell me that no, can't be done. If, that, if that's the case, <laughs> that's fine. But if, it, if it's something that's even possible, then I, again, I think we should be asking that question. I think that you, you, it, it's a good point. You, you, know, you, could, you could bring in a policy. The, the problem is, though, it's not law. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have a policy, but when the court, the, the, the judge will, will uh, make a determination based on, on the law and they will mm -hmm. listen to the representations of both parties. So. It, it, it wouldn't provide you with absolute protection, if you like. Um, 
it's certainly to guide us in that direction. We do strive to, to go down the PPO route as, as frequently as possible, but it takes two to tango, and we have on the other side either agreeing or the court uh, and making a, 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 an order, a determination. Do you have any thoughts on that? I suppose and then the other point to make is that the courts have a role to play in this as well, and the judiciary, obviously, are the ultimate arbiter in terms of um, proven settlements for, for children and uh, persons under a disability. So when these high value, for example, birth injury cases come to the court for approval, it's only at the ultimately at the direction of the judge that those cases are then approved and that settlement's agreed. So in practice um, and, and in principle, most practitioners on the plaintiff side will work with us and cooperate to agree suitable settlement arrangements for those children or, or, or people under disability who have been harmed as a result of clinical negligence. And then the court has a role to play to then agree and approve those settlements, uh, and certainly the judges will very ro are, do robustly deal with that issue in, in court, and will challenge the representatives will. The settlement isn't appropriate for whatever reason. So, um, as to the point of whether it's policy or legislation, uh, I think it's more likely legislation. But certainly happy to, to engage in that conversation. I think a discussion with the health minister, I think, would, would be a prudent step. I would agree. Yeah, and, and, and again, I'm not ruling it out of being legislative. I'm just, as as Sinead has also alluded to, just can't see how you, how we work it out between the public bodies and and the private insurance companies. But look, I I do think it's something that we should ask the department, the justice department, about anyhow, and see uh, is there a way around that. But thank you, appreciate your your presentation. Thank you, thank you, chair. Okay, Sinead. Chair, thank you. Uh, just a quick point while we have uh, Mark and Alfie there. It's just, I suppose, to develop my thoughts further on the PPO um, proposal. So I, I'd be keen to know um, whenever a settlement does happen, and I appreciate, thankfully, these are relatively small numbers of people, um, but when the lump sum payments do go out, all of this framework we talk about um, is based on a notional portfolio and a, you know, um, it's not very high risk. But in terms of the reality, a person actually receiving a large lump sum, is the department aware if ever or always or never that the lump sum is managed well and does last um, the claimant through their lifetime? Or are the department aware of situations where X amount of years later that person turns up back into the system needing access to public funds for that care because it was perhaps mismanaged or overestimated or underestimated and I'm just wondering the long-term trajectory of a lump sum and the reality of it in the health service. Thank you. Well, there's, a, there's a potential for it to be squandered if, if that's what you're getting at. Uh, you see it. Um, I don't know if the department actually tracks it, um, so we have the ability to do it, but I think that's one of the advantages of PPO as well, that you, you know that this money is going on an annual basis to the person who needs it, and quite often that person will lack capacity as well, so it's someone looking after it for them, so uh, that, that's, that's uh, one of the, the, the major benefits, not, well, another benefit of, of the PPO system. But I'm not, I'm not aware of being able to track what happens in lump sums. I think that once it's gone, it's gone. That's... And our experience has been that the, the majority of these high value cases with, with children and persons under disability have been um, settled by way of PPO. Um, for the, I think in, in the insurance industry, there might be obviously vastly more lump sum arrangements. Um, and the Office of Care and Protection would have a role to play as well in the court in terms of um, plaintiffs who, who perhaps lack capacity. But, but in terms of the lump sum, I suppose that the reason we, we don't advocate the use of lump sums is the astronomical sums of money involved. And we're now talking about tens of millions of pounds in the hands of a, a, a plaintiff and, and a family who are going to require quite significant expert investment advice. Um, and that, that brings a risk for, for vulnerable people and their families in terms of how they manage that risk and manage those um, huge sums of money. Um, whereas we believe the appropriate vehicle for compensating them um, over the duration of their lifetime is the PPO um, to remove that risk. And, and as I say, there, there's risk and reward on both sides. Um, 
And for defendants, obviously, it, it draws out the process because defendants will be making payments for, for decades to come. Um, but it, it's a fair way of dealing with compensation and strikes the right balance, we believe, um, in the interests of both parties. Thank you. Um, thanks to Alfie and Mark. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. I think that is then everybody. So if I can, um, just before then we move on to the, the, the next session, if I can then just thank Mr McGuinness and uh, Mr Harvey for spending the time with the committee. Um, that's been much appreciated and very helpful to us, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. Okay, members, there was a couple of points that members did raise there as well, just to follow up with the Department of Health, so we'll be taking a note of, of those, um, uh, and we will follow up on that uh, in due course. So we'll move into the next evidence session then, and that's from the Medical uh, Defence Union. So there's a written submission, pages 34 to 36, and hopefully I'm able to uh, welcome Dr Lee, who's the Executive Director uh, within Professional Services, and also uh, Mr Reynolds, Head of Government and External Relations within the Medical uh, Defence Union. We'll record this by Hansard, we'll publish a transcript in due course, and I'm going to hand over to yourselves to give us a brief outline of your submission, and then we'll follow that up with some questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. In now time on a fashion, can I just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you very much. And uh, can I start by extending a thanks uh, on behalf of the Medical Defence Union uh, to you and the Deputy Chair and other members of the committee for inviting us to appear before you this morning. The Medical Defence Union is a mutual, not-for-profit organisation, and we are owned and ran solely for the benefit of our members. And in their number are doctors, GPs, dentists, other healthcare professionals across Northern Ireland. Our support for them spans a number of areas of their professional practice, from investigation by a regulator, to disciplinary proceedings by their employer, to claims of clinical negligence. And I should say that we are in constant awe of the dedication of our members to delivering safe and effective, compassionate patient care and on a day where Northern Ireland leads the way in opening up COVID-19 vaccinations to all adults, I think it's quite clear to see that the heavy lifting that's been done in recent months most definitely has been done by our GPs. So our concern in coming before you today is, is particularly acute, and that's a policy decision on, by government on the personal injury discount rate, either the interim rate, which I'm very conscious we can't go into today, or the mechanism within this bill for setting that rate in the future could have a severe and adverse effect on GPs, and that is deeply regressible. We, we do have profound concerns about the revised uh, rate methodology proposed in this bill, uh, and there are changes we would like to see. Um, however, we very much echo the sentiments uh, given by Mark and Alfie just, and it's uh, very heartening to hear the, the deputy chair's comments and other members of the committee and their commitment to getting this bill through, but that really is our central message to the committee today. The prospects of a minus 1.75 rate in, in, enduring indefinitely or for any longer than is necessary uh, would have profound consequences for the cost of clinical negligence in Northern Ireland, and this really should be avoided at, at all costs. But with all that being the case, we do have to emphasise to this committee that we're coming before you today to say that if and when this bill is passed, it cannot be considered job done. There really is a piece of work here for a future executive, a future assembly to look at again, and, and I'll provide a very quick summary of those now, Chair, if I may. Uh, the key changes we would like to see is that the Department of Justice should be under a duty to gather evidence of what claimant investment behaviour actually is in the real world, rather than based on the hypotheses and assumptions built into this legislation. And I know Alfie and, uh, and Mark touched on that a moment ago, because we can't escape the fact, and there is that balance to be struck, that for every pound that leaves the healthcare system to pay for a cost of clinical negligence, there is less money for frontline patient care for the countless other patients who may be uh, suffering or uh, be subject to a similar ongoing health need but can't prove negligence and require a properly funded healthcare system. So we need to see the full picture. We also believe that a framework for the PIDR should rule out any retrospective effects. Any new discount rate should only apply to compensation awards relating to incidents that took place after the date of the change in rate. 
And finally, Chair, they're, they're absolutely, and I, I'm pleased to see this point has been made already, there absolutely must be political accountability here. I note the steer this committee has been given by the Minister for Justice about what its remit is, but, but somewhere in this process, there has to be political accountability, given the significant ramifications this policy decision can have. Um, its implications can be profound, as I say. So we would like to see uh, an impact assessment built into the legislation, a proper impact assessment that requires the government, before a rate review comes up, a requirement on them to go out to speak across government, particularly to the Department of Health, to build a, few, uh, a full picture, and for that impact assessment to be laid before the Assembly so members can see in advance the possible ramifications of a discount rate of X, Y, or, or Z. Um, at that point, and just to conclude our opening remarks, I'd like to pass over to my senior colleague, Dr. Matthew Lee, um, who will conclude by uh, contextualising really what impact a change in the rate um, can mean for our members and also what we've seen in other jurisdictions when these rates have changed uh, recently. So, Matt, if I could just hand over to you at that point. Thank you, Tom. Um, and just to start to explain, I am I'm a doctor, but I'm 21 years out of medical practice, having been at the MDU now for over 20 years. And my remit includes both our provision of legal services, our medical legal um, advice, and also our claims handling. Um, and I also cover our under, underwriting department. So I have a, a broad range of experience about how um, uh, changes in, in, in regulation and law impact on claims costs and then fundamentally how they push through to indemnity costs and how those indemnity costs can impact on the health service at, at, it, at its heart. Even before we saw the changes to the discount rate in Northern Ireland, indemnity costs were becoming a very unaffordable burden for GPs. Um, they've been cited as a significant factor in early retirements, um, in our members dropping their sessions, even in the recruitment of new doctors into, into primary care. In England and Wales, we were seeing a similar effect, which was partly and well largely addressed by the introduction of state indemnity for GPs. And it's probably worth me highlighting that removing the indemnity for NHS clinical negligence claims from English and Welsh GPs had the effect of pushing the average indemnity cost down from around eight to ten thousand pounds per individual GP to under one thousand pounds. So so the, the cost of indemnity really is driven by the cost of clinical negligence claims, but not, not just any claim, um, it's specifically driven by the cost of high value clinical negligence claims. Across our UK wide GP claims portfolio, around 70% of case reserves are held against just 7% of the highest value cases. So and it's these exact high value cases that are predominantly affected by changes in the discount rate. So there is a very real prospect um, that a sustained minus 1.75% discount rate will push through to very significant changes in indemnity costs. But even long term, um, a discount rate that, that overcompensates in any way um, will push through to a bigger burden on, on the health service and individual GPs. The size of most high value claims is driven by lifelong care costs. Those are both health costs and social costs. And in the absence of legal reforms, these care costs will continue to be calculated on the basis that the care, both socially and health, will be provided privately. Although the reality is that very few um, compensated patients receive all aspects of their social care and their health care for the rest of their lives on a private basis. We've had cases where we've made lump sum settlements despite the injured party being settled into local authority care with all their health needs being met by the NHS, and yet the system at the moment will compensate on the basis that at some point in their life, which could be tomorrow, that will have to change to a private arrangement and therefore a full lump sum private payment is made. So this, this is very significant um, and there's a very significant um, prospect that very low discount rates will, will lead to significant overcompensation. A drop of the magnitude recently seen in Northern Ireland could have the effect of pushing up some of the claims values by two or three fold. I know Mark Harvey mentioned some examples, uh, a real world example for us when the discount rate dropped in England from 2.5% positive to negative 0.25%, one of our GP claims that had previously been valued by us at 4.5% actually settled subsequently for 10, uh, 4.5 million, sorry, actually settled subsequently for 10.6 million. So more than double what we felt it was worth previous uh, discount rate. And that was a minus 0.5% effect. The, the position in Northern Ireland obviously at the moment is a drop from 2.5% positive to minus 1.75%, so even more profound. Um, 
So I'll, I'll probably wrap up at that point, but, but I guess it's, it's key to echo what Tom has said and what um, was being said by HSC as well, that uh, a sustained negative rate of minus 1.75% will have very profound effects on the size of claims um, brought both against hospital um, practitioners and, and the health service, but also against individual GPs who are responsible for their own indemnity costs. A question was raised a few minutes ago about why are GPs responsible for their own indemnity costs? And I think the core answer is that they are independent contractors to the health service. They run their own businesses. They have their own responsibilities. As things stand at present, they sort out their own insurances and their own indemnity. In, the, in England and Wales, clearly the state has come to an arrangement whereby those independent contractors are centrally indemnified. Um, we would be very supportive to see something similar in, in Northern Ireland because this burden really is damaging our members um, significantly on a day-by-day -day basis. And with that, I'm happy to work with Tom to answer any questions you've got. Okay, thank you. That's been very helpful. Uh, two questions just for me, um, if you can just elaborate on why you believe that the methodology that's proposed in this bill for calculating the rate is greatly flawed. And secondly, the Department of Justice, are, they've said that the Scottish model gives greater transparency and clarity in comparison to the England and Welsh model. And then that maybe ties into your points around accountability as to who takes the final decision. So maybe you can just address those points for me. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll take the, the second question, if I may, and hand over to Matt for, for, for the first. I think our concerns, uh, and, and you've gone to the very heart of it in that, in that final comment, is that while the, the, the methodology proposed in this bill, there is a great degree of transparency, that is absolutely true. The assumptions built into that are very hard to test. The, um, uh, the, the methodology by which the rate setters will be operating, uh, it isn't a perfect science, has already been discussed this morning. Uh, it does need to be open to the widest possible group of stakeholders so we get the fullest possible picture and we feel without building in that broad uh, that broad oversight that broad need to consult a, a large number of stakeholders uh, we, we we're not delivering the best, most accurate possible rate. At the moment, we've seen a situation whereby there's a strong argument in favour of the 2.5% the rate uh, leading to undercompensation. There is now no doubt in our mind that the minus 1.75 rate is likely to significantly veer towards overcompensation. Um, this isn't an exact science, and for, for, for a rate to be arrived at that properly reflects the realities of the day and the moving nature of the economy and everything else, the multitude of factors, there needs to be regular engagement with a broader group of stakeholders than is proposed in this bill. So that, that, is, a, that is a fundamental um, concern for us and something we'd like to see, um, like to see changed. Um, Matt, could I hand over to you for that first question, please? Yeah, I suppose I would fall back onto the, the comments that Tom made earlier about what the methodologies are actually trying to achieve because in the in the real world this this money is paid and, and it is paid by the defense organizations generally as a lump sum to the claimants um, and it and it isn't necessarily used in lives for healthcare and social care um, when a lump sum is paid um, provisions are put in place to provide suitable accommodation um, with a significant amount of money in hand, then that accommodation can can there's, there's more flexibility as to how that how that works. But equally, of course, then some of the money is invested, and the basis of the rates that we're seeing is is on a very low risk portfolio. But the reality is we don't we don't think that that is the basis on which most claimants are advised to invest. It, it would be very unusual to go to an investment advisor, and I should point out that, that many of the law firms who are pursuing these claims have their own investment arms that advise their own clients. It would be very unusual to advise someone to invest at a rate that was going to lose them money significantly over in the longer term. In fact, realistically, one would expect that you would take a degree of risk, diversify that risk, and put that into a portfolio that was safe, but not, not without risk. And so some of the basic premises in, in, in these methodologies we're not sure and uh, necessarily shouldn't be revisited. Um, it, what, is, what is the worst case scenario is that someone puts their investments into something that doesn't fully compensate, it doesn't fully compensate for the rest of their lives. Well, in, in, in the world we live in at the moment, there are, as Tom pointed out, many, many individuals with health issues that don't have these enormous lump sums or these enormous payments or, or ongoing periodic payments to fall back on. And the health service is there for them and social services are there for them. So it, it is not an absolute disaster in the later stages. 
you don't have sufficient funds to meet every type of unanticipated medical care that might be needed in the future or every um, type of social arrangement that might be needed in the future because the state remains there to support all individuals. What is a disaster is if you have a system that massively overcompensates both has a significant impact on frontline clinicians but equally takes money out of the health service um, we've also had cases where we know that we've we've made lumps significant lump sum payments and we've heard that uh, say a patient has has died shortly afterwards that money never comes back to the health service that money never comes back to the to the defense organizations who rely on their mutual members to, to contribute towards the funds that, that are spent on claims that money stays stays out there so this, this is the development of a system that will almost automatically overcompensate in the majority of cases, and in many cases very significantly, and that, that has a real burden on the health service provision. Okay, okay, that, that's helpful. Um, and just, just for absolute clarity, and I think you've made some good points around the need for a, a broader impact assessment um, that would write across the different stakeholders that would be interested in this and have, have a view on it before a new rate would be set. but. Is it the, the, the view that ultimately this should be signed off at ministerial level, having taken into account a very broad assessment as to the implications of what the new rate would be? We believe so, Chair. Yes, uh, it is absolutely essential for our members, people who uh, are, you know, particularly our GP members, who are paying these subscriptions out of their hard-earned, hard-earned money. That any any decision of this magnitude, they they have someone to go to, and th there is accountability in this legislation. Of course, there is. However, there can never be any greater accountability than a minister drawn from an elected assembly, such as the Northern Ireland Assembly. So that, that is something we would firmly support. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me bring in members then, Linda Dillon and then Shania Bradley. Linda? Thank you, Chair, and thank you to both Thomas and to, to Matthew for your submission. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm kind of back to the some of the issues that, that we raised with the, the previous presentation. And in relation to the, the issue around indemnity, Chair, again, I, I think we need to get some clarity, even from the Health Minister, ha, is there any intention to bring GPs um, in under the NHS in terms of indemnity? Because I think that would actually deal with a lot of the issues that are being, not all, but a lot of the issues that are being raised um, in relation to the impact on GPs. And, and I, I do have sympathy with GPs around that issue of indemnity. Um, and at the end of the day, we need to have GPs. We need to have a frontline service. We're, we're we're very well aware of that. I suppose, Matthew, I take a wee bit of of issue in terms of what you're saying around the, the fact that if somebody doesn't have this access to this compensation in later life, the state is there to look after them. Um, at this moment in time, and and I'm sure it's no different across the water. But I can certainly tell you at this moment in time, our health service is not there for an awful lot of people. And it is a disaster for them. And, and, and I suppose I'm just being frank about that. It shouldn't be the case. And I would certainly like to think in years to come, with, with a lot of work from all of us, we'll have a better health service. But I do have sympathy because we'll only have a better health service if we have a better frontline service in terms of GPs. And, and I do think that, that there may, may need to be, there will, may need to be some some ideas around how we, how we do that. And I think the indemnity issue is one that we we need to, it's outside the remit of this committee, but I would like to, to find out. It was one of the questions that I asked at the very beginning whenever this first came to us, um, you know, what was the view of the health minister around the, the this particular piece of legislation? Um, we didn't get that, to be, to be honest with you. Um, and, and maybe he saw it as outside of his remit, which is far enough, but it has got a serious impact on, on the department and on the provision of, of GP services. So. I do have certainly have sympathy, but I would like to bottom out the issue around indemnity, Chair. And I also have sympathy around how you know how you reach a hundred percent compensation and how that's worked out. And I don't think there is any perfect system. And again, that's why I go back to what what was raised by the the previous presentation, and again was was alluded to here is the periodical payment orders. Maybe we could how we could look at more of those happening, particularly where it's a public body. 
I think it will be much more difficult where it's, where it's not a public body it's, and almost impossible. And I absolutely wouldn't blame anybody for not taking a, you know, not agreeing to a periodical payment order where it's not a public body. But I do think where it's a public body, it's absolutely where we should be looking to. And that protects the individual, if they, you know, and, and make sure that the money is spent on, on what they actually need rather than what, what somebody else may potentially spend it on. So, Chair, just, it, it's, it's very much the same issues to, to the previous, some of which are within our remit, some of which are not, but we all have a remit to be concerned about health. So I do want to find out from the Health Minister what the plans are around indemnity for, for GPs and insurance. So if we can, again, just um, check that out. And I suppose that's not really... Um, not really questions for yourself the more points but but i do want to reassure you is that we, we we do have sympathy around some of the issues that you're raising but we also have a responsibility to ensure that that there is a hundred percent compensation but i accept some of what you're saying around overcompensation we, we want to ensure that that doesn't happen either so um not not an easy one for any of us to address but but we'll certainly work with you to try and get the, the best outcome for everybody thank you chair Thank you. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to Matt and Thomas. Uh, a couple of points I'd like to maybe elaborate on. Um, firstly, the retrospective piece. You say that you don't think it should be retrospective. So I'm just mindful. Um, we know there are parties for different reasons at different times holding back on getting a final settlement. So I just want you to elaborate on that, um, because even if we move for a short period to an interim, then does that mean, you know, what is the effect there? So you're just thinking there should be a clean slate. And I'd just be interested to hear some more thoughts on that. Um, the second part is about, you know, your recommendation to the, to the department about um, understanding further the outcomes and I'm a little bit torn in that. I'd, I'd like to hear your thinking on that because ultimately at the point where that money, um, where that determination has been made and the judgment has been made on what the settlement is in whatever form it takes, that money very much stops being public money and it becomes private and personal. And I'm just wondering, we're going into the realms of, you know, how far into that could we ultimately even hope to reach that would be reasonable? Um, and I also want to ask the question then about, you know, you're talking about the, the bill being flawed because of this, um, the absence of, I suppose, the stakeholders being part of um, on a regular basis, you know, the intermittent reviews of it. You're saying that they're not there, that they have no part to play in this. So I, I, I appreciate and I don't fully understand the complexities of the government actuaries. You know, it's a very complex uh, department and what they do. But my understanding would have been that although it's a very um, precise calculation, you know, and almost in a cold sense, but I would have thought that factored into that would have been the realities of life at that moment and time. And I'm just interested to know, are you suggesting that you don't feel that that, that that is captured, that the government actuaries is void of your reality and the reality of, of the person and the claimant? Thank you. Shall I, shall I pick up the last of those points and possibly the first? In terms of stakeholder involvement, um, clearly you can do an actuarial calculation based on factors like life expectancy, anticipated care costs, um, anticipated future developments in, in, in care costs because healthcare changes all the time and, and care costs change very significantly for some of these lifelong conditions. But the reality is that very few claims actually settle based on an actuarial calculation. Um, only about 2% of our claims actually get resolved in court. Around 98% of claims get settled based on a negotiation. And that negotiation takes into account all sorts of factors, but one of those factors is, is the strength of the evidence that actually the negligence occurred in the first place and the impact that that negligence had on what might have been a condition that, that was going to be experienced anyway, but was possibly worsened by that negligence. So an awful lot of, of the, the, the work that's done in determining um, how those negotiations pan through um, is actually handled outside any, any form of mathematical calculations or any form of actuarial input. It's, it's, it's worked on in terms of 
um, a, a number of factors, what experts have got to say in those cases, and the dynamics of those types of meetings, when one involves mediation, when one involves hot tubbing of, ex hot -tubbing of experts, when one involves um, formal roundtable negotiation, um, and even in those cases when one goes to court, all of those can change over time. So if one is reviewing the rate every five years, it may not just be the actuarial factors that have changed, but there may be all sorts of other factors about how the claims are actually resolved in, in the real world that have changed as well, which is why we feel that, that a number of stakeholders need to be involved in, in that type of, of, of assessment of the quantum of the claims. But, but equally, a number of the things that I spoke about and Tom spoke about, about the effect on the health service, are also significant. So if, if one is going to put in a system that purely relies on an actuarial calculation and actuarial um, assessment, then, then that, that, that information is less relevant, but the sort of things that you're hearing about the impact on GP recruitment, the impact on retention, um, all of those change over time and have become significantly more acute over the last five to ten years. And, and I, I say I've been at the MDU 20 years and GP indemnity costs have tripled in the time that I've been here, which is purely driven by claims inflation. And to not have a voice of those on the front line in the health service that are being directly impacted. And, and this isn't just a voice from the doctors, but this is a voice potentially from the patients who will be impacted if the health service is struggling with staffing and resourcing and the ability to provide a service we think is, 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 not, um, it, it, it is not the way that we should be putting a structure in place to determine the rate long term. We think all those voices need to be heard. The one point I would make about the retrospective effect, um, and I think I'd, I'd go back to the, the first conversation in this, in this meeting where um, before Tom and I came on, where people were saying, are, are, are claims actually being delayed in settlement? What is the effect of having changes in the rate that are pending? If you have a system that every five years the rate changes and then the rate changes the value of all the claims retrospectively, then you have all sorts of dynamics going on around, are we really going to settle? What do we think the rate's going to be in the future? Have we collected enough money? Do we need to put up our subscription subsequently? What do we do if we've over collected money? And the, by doing so, we've pushed, pushed GPs out of the health service because we've, we've anticipated it's going to be worse than it, than it really turns out to be. All of those sort of factors are taken away if you have a, a, a rate that is effective based on the date that the proceedings are brought in the case. So if the proceedings are brought on, on a date when the rate is, is minus 0.75%, if subsequently three years down the line the rate changes to minus 1.75% again, then should that whole case be revalued or actually should that case progress on the basis of the date proceedings were, were brought? And that, that's our point on the retrospective effect. It takes away all that uncertainty for those that are actually handling the cases and, and those that are, that are looking for, for uh, uh, the cases to be concluded because, as I say, some of the dynamics could lead to delays or, or even cases being accelerated, um, which isn't always in anyone's interest either. Matt, if I could just add a few points uh, to those questions that were, were posed to us. Um, so on the, on the point about the role of the Department of, of Health at the stage where they're consulted, we think there is a great role because, as has already been mentioned in this hearing today, the Department of Justice is required to be blind to all the external factors. The question is about 100% compensation. That is a theme that runs through many um, of, of, of the limbs of the law that surrounds clinical negligence. I mean, we've already touched on this briefly. But the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Act, Northern Ireland, 1948, Section 34 of that Act requires the courts, when determining a compensation award, to completely discount the availability of public health care provision, either in Northern Ireland or in Great Britain. And so, as a consequence, not only in the, the, the setting of the compensation award in the first instance are we being blind to the wider uh, effects of this, then when we're assessing the ongoing ability of the HSC and others to provide that care, we we're simply not sure uh, because the department hasn't hasn't got the evidence as to whether people with those compensation awards are receiving that care in a HSC uh, facility, which in all likelihood they are, and thus receiving and and thus HSC is having to pay twice. And it, it, it's a source of great concern because, as we know, it's a very high bar to uh, successfully establish a clinical negligence claim. And for every person uh, that, that is able to make that claim, there will be patients within the system with comparable long-term healthcare needs where this is just more money that is not available for them so I mean that's why we think there is a role for the Department of Health somewhere in this process uh, I mean we're not coming with an absolute blueprint in, in the spirit of candor we're not saying we've got a, a magic solution to this. this this entire framework is not an exact science we just think the more people that are in the room the better the likelihood of a more rounded decision which is why the uh, enhanced stakeholder engagement piece we think is uh, is worthy of exploring 
Thank you. I appreciate that, um, Thomas and Matthew. Matthew, you, you raised a figure there um, that I would like to follow up on. You're talking about um, the, the actual negotiating and then the settlement, and that that largely happens outside of a court. So, you know, we were talking earlier about, I don't know if you heard our um, earlier presentation, and we were talking about the trying to lean in more to encouraging the use of the PPO, certainly in the public sector where you can, you know, manage budgets better and plan that out better. So, and there was reference made that there may be legislation in other parts, or, or they're looking at legislation about encouraging judges um, to maybe give them the power to use a PPO, you know, to settle based on a PPO. So with those figures, then you're saying 98% um, settlements happen outside of court. Would you think that any legislation in that part there may be redundant? I wouldn't say it's necessarily redundant because the settlement may be reached out of court, but may still need the court to agree that the settlement actually is appropriate for the for the patient concerned. So where you have higher value cases, then there will still be a final sign off by by the court on those on the on the agreement that's been reached between the parties. Um, I suppose one point I would make in that respect is is that the defence organisations work on a discretionary basis. Um, it's, it's different to insurance. We're not insurers. Um, we hold a mutual fund um, where we make a payment on behalf of a member. It's made from that mutual fund. Um, and, that, and, and as such, we're not um, regulated insurers and, and we can't make a straightforward periodic payment order in the way that, that an insurer could um, and certainly the government, the government can. So uh, if, if one was looking at that type of legislation and wanted it to work through for primary care as well as secondary care in, in, in Northern Ireland, then you would need to look at a, a state scheme effectively to support um, the GPs to be able to provide those periodic payments for, for GP claims as well as hospital claims. And, and of course, many of the cases are not clear cut between being general practice or secondary care. Many of our cases involve someone who is seen by a GP, um, an assessment is made, at some point, they are then referred into an A&E department. Um, a further assessment is made in the hospital. They may be discharged back home. There may be quite a bit of dynamic in terms of the delay that occurred in the, di in the ultimate diagnosis and treatment that is both sits with, with the primary care involvement and with the secondary care involvement. We have had some success um, in England and Wales where um, we've got NHS resolution dealing with the hospital cases and, and had previously the defence organisations dealing with the individual GP uh, involvement in the cases of settling on the basis that the defence organisations paid a lump sum and then the periodic payments were met by the government funding available through NHS resolution. Um, but generally now, um, one, of the, one of the reasons that I think the government was keen in England and Wales to pull everything into a state scheme was it simplified that, that settlement process. And they're now in a position with the cases that are being dealt with wholly by NHS resolution, both for GPs and secondary care, to, to provide periodic payments across the, across the piece. Whereas currently, as it stands in Northern Ireland, if there's a mixed case where you have a GP and you have um, the health service involved as well, the secondary care health service involved, you may not be in a position to offer a periodic payment if you're looking to split the, the apportionment. Thank you, that's helpful. I appreciate it's a step away, perhaps from the actual framework we're looking at, but I, it does give a recognition to the reality beyond that framework, so that's very insightful. Thank you to you both. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can bring in Doug Beattie. Thank you, Chair, and, and apologies for, for, for being late. And, and Matthew and Thomas, th thank you. I mean, a, a deeply complicated issue um, looking at the framework. Um, but can I just ask, just on, on, on the margins of that, why is the GP indemnity cost the highest here than they are anywhere else in, in the UK? Is there a reason for that? And can that be addressed? Uh, and the secondly is, listening to you, so are, are we saying that if we get this wrong, if we don't strike the rate um, or, or look at the, the, the framework around striking the rate uh, in, in a sensible manner, that we could price GPs out of the uh, out of the market, and so to speak, and in which case stop GPs in the future coming forward wanting to be GPs? Is that, is that the danger that we're in here? I think that's exactly the danger we're in. Um, the, the, the first part of your question is quite easy, but also comes with a, with a reassuring um, message in the tail. 
the, the indemnity costs for GPs in Northern Ireland are the highest across um, the UK, primarily because the state schemes come in in England and Wales. Prior, prior to that, the indemnity cost for GPs in England and Wales was slightly higher, um, speaking from my own experience of MDU, than Northern Ireland. The, the cost in Scotland is significantly lower, and those costs are driven by the litigation environment and the law in the, in the various countries. Um, so you, you weren't the, the leaders in respect of the, the, the worst indemnity costs until, and, until the, the English and Welsh governments put in place those, those indemnity schemes. Um, remind me of the second part of your question. Yeah, it was just about, uh, I mean, the danger of pricing GPs out of the market and stopping new GPs coming forward if we end up with a, with, with a structure around setting a, a rate which in the future could, could really sort of have a detrimental effect. I think uh, what, what this has the potential to do is to accelerate the effect that you're talking about. But to be honest, we're already seeing signs that, that cost of indemnity is doing exactly what you're, what you're describing. So it is, it is becoming an increasing burden for, for general practitioners who themselves are struggling for resource. And if they, if they want to bring in more GPs into their practices to help with, with, with the, the under-resourcing, then again, the indemnity costs go up even further because of that. Um, so yes, I think uh, this isn't. This is something that could compound um, a problem, but it's a problem that is developing almost exponentially anyway. Um, we're seeing a doubling of claims costs about every seven to eight years, um, and as I say, those are those are ninety percent behind the cost of indemnity that the GPs are buying. So, irrespective of, of where this ultimately goes to, I, I would say if the, if the minus 1.75% rate stays any longer than a, than a short interim, then that in itself could cause a step change in indemnity costs, because without the certainty that we're going to move back to, to something lower, that, that could be a very significant burden for, for the mutuals to have to pull some more money in from GPs. But, but even, even if everything had stayed at 2.5% positive, um, things were starting to reach breaking point. So I think the, it's a completely different subject around state indemnity for GPs, but um, this, this might really make the case once and for all for that state indemnity coming in. And if we look at the architecture around the setting of that rate then, um, Matt and Tommy, I mean, can we look at England and Scotland to see the effect that, that has had on GPs? I mean, have we had a, you know, looking at the, the, the different systems in England and the different system in Scotland, is there any way we can look at the comparison of the effect that has had on GPs in, in, a, in a, either a hemorrhaging or an increase of GPs because it's more attractive in any way? Is, is there anything out there, data out there, that can help us with that? Well, I mean, what I can certainly say, I mean, when um, the, the we were in a similar situation in England where the, the rates were, just ma were making GP subscriptions almost to the point of being untenable, the MDU was the first medical defence organisation to put its, uh, put its hand up and say there needs to be a state indemnity for GPs. This is becoming unsustainable. Um, and as Matt says, if this endures for any longer than a very short period in Northern Ireland, this is, we're in a precarious situation anyway, something needs to be done. I mean, I mean, I mean while I have the floor, as it were, I, I should just say that we did say in our evidence to the committee at paragraph 8 that we were in discussions with the Department of Health about uh, any policy intervention that they might be able to make in the short term to offset the worst impacts of, of this on GP subscriptions. Um, to date, we haven't had any uh, indication that they are able or, or, or willing to make that sort of an intervention. So uh, the MDE, along with other defence organisations, other bodies, will, will have to go away and look at this in the interest of the mutual fund to make sure that we are pricing accordingly uh, for, for the risk that GPs have been exposed to because of a policy decision that has been made. And it comes back to our central point. You know, this is a policy decision that isn't a, a simply a legal technicality. The discount rate isn't an abstract legal concept. It's not an exact science. It's a complex piece, which is why we're all coming to this with a very you know, open mind. You know, we, you know, we're here today to try and assist the committee in any way we can. But that central message is someone needs to be accountable for these decisions. And there needs to be the widest pool of consultation as well. Uh, Matt, I don't know whether you wanted to add anything to that. Just add one thing. Um, what we were seeing um, before, uh, over the last, say, five years, was a, a steadily reducing age at which GPs were choosing to retire. And within our portfolio of GPs, we were seeing more and more of them moving to work part time and do less days each week. So there was some there was some clear there was some clear evidence that, that people were were effectively moving out of full time general practice or, or even even stopping early. Um, but that was prior to COVID, um, and COVID is going to have a really um, a, a really significant effect uh, on uh, the pre and post 
um, evidence that might be available. All sorts of GPs have come back um, into the profession to help out with the COVID response. But then we hear that the COVID itself um, has caused around, if you take the BMAs, to around 25% of doctors to question whether they even want to carry on being a doctor. So quite what effect that will have on, on ongoing retirement rates and recruitment is hard to say. Um, so I, I think, unfortunately, if we hadn't had COVID, I might be able to say to you now, those retirement rates have changed. The recruitment rates were going up. There were signs that recruitment into general practice was starting to improve and was starting to, to the vacancies that we saw for a couple of years were starting to get fickled. But then COVID came, and I think that's going to mess up any evidence that we might have been able to take pre and post um, of, the, of the nature you're describing. Yeah, um, listen, thank, thank you, man. Thank you, uh, Thomas. I actually have you know, paragraph eight open here whenever you were talking, Thomas, uh, and, and about the interventions. And I think that's what um, uh, Linda was, was alluding to, to make sure that we get that from the, the health minister. But listen, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Sinead, are you wanting back in there, just? Chair, yes, thank you. Just a very quick point in terms of um, just while well, the medical dementia neural, in terms of the organisations, um, are there any safeguards inbuilt from your perspective that will look at, like I come from a rural constituency in South Down, it's predominantly rural, and in terms of um, what role you have to support GP practices to make sure that there is fair access to GPs and that they are able to stay open whilst this is all unravelling? Thank you. Um, I suppose one of the questions that is, that is not established um, for any of the defence organisations is, is whether the short-term change to minus 1.75% is going to have any immediate effect on indemnity costs or whether the organisations feel able to, to look towards the future and the certainty that we might see in the future and, and, and try to restrict any immediate swings now in indemnity costs on the basis that, that we're hoping the, the rate will become um, uh, even out to some extent in the, in the medium term. So that, that isn't, isn't clear. Um, it, it's difficult. I mean, we haven't seen, I mean, certainly there have been um, broad discussions around the possibility of state indemnity in Northern Ireland. And that, that I guess, is the, is the one thing that might really protect the profession from potentially soaring indemnity costs in the future. But, but those certainly, I mean, it's a matter of public record that they haven't progressed in the way that they have in, in England and Wales and haven't resulted in a scheme as of, as of yet. Um, I think this, this whole subject may actually turn focus back onto that, onto that question around a state indemnity. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that in, in, the, in the medium to long term, this is, this is reaching a point at which it's unsustainable. Um, however, the discount rate ultimately pans out, unless it goes to a very positive rate, which I don't see happening for many, many years, then, then I think the indemnity costs are going to keep pushing up through other factors as well. The discount rate isn't the only factor that pushes up claims inflation. There are a number of others, um, and in fact, it tends to ratchet up. Whenever there's a precedent set in a court case, then that is the new norm, um, and that ratchets up costs further. Whenever there is a medical development that a new expensive drug comes out, a new robotic aid comes out to help people who've got weakness in their lower body, all of those immediately change the dynamic around the cost of cases. Um, and so there are a number of other factors which I think will bring this to a head, whether the discount rate ultimately does or not. Um, and, but I think this may focus attention on, on the need for state indemnity, and we, we support that. I mean, it may sound odd as an indemnifier to say we'd like the state to take over the indemnity arrangements for GPs, but actually we're a members mutual organisation. We, we don't exist for anything other than our members. Um, in England and Wales, our membership numbers of GPs have grown since state indemnity came in, partly because GPs can afford to, 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 to choose the service now which, which they, they want to go to and, and we, we, we've seen a healthy development of our, of, of our company um, simply because um, GPs still need what, we're, what we're, we're, we're providing to them in terms of the non-claims benefits. So we absolutely support um, a, a future introduction of state indemnity because we don't see how this ultimately ends if that doesn't happen. 
Matt, and if I could just very briefly, because I am conscious of the uh, committee's time, just make a, a few very quick observations on the back of that. I mean, our obligation to our members is to protect the mutual funds so that when anyone needs to call on us for assistance, we are able to assist, which is why, uh, Sinead, to go to your an initial question um, uh, in the first round about why we believe the system should be uh, should rule out any retrospective effect. It's quite simply because the money that was being charged in subscription rates two, three years ago for GPs who may have since retired, uh, if, it, if it doesn't rule out that retrospective effect, it will fall on the GPs of the future, the GPs of today, who are still practicing to pick up the shortfall. And as Matt says, you know, we're in this for the members. You know, we are a mutual organization. So it will be, we are governed by what is in the best interests of our members. And because of that, that's why we're coming before you today to say that this will unequivocally have an effect if it lasts for any longer than a very short period of time. Because regardless of whether we are the indemnifiers or whether we are just the defense organization supporting the good name of the profession and doctor's professional interests. Our members want to work in a healthcare system that is firing on all cylinders and has got maximum resource open to it. And any money that goes on these compensation awards is money that is coming out of patient care, frontline patient care. We fully acknowledge fair compensation is needed, but we just feel that in that great balance, that, that fact can't be, can't be lost. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead and uh, Matt and Thomas. Can I thank you both for your time with the committee today? It's been helpful and much appreciated, so thank you. We're very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, let's move into the next session then, and uh, we will have Dr. Alan Stout, Chair of the BMA, Northern Ireland General Practitioners Committee, and pages 38 to 40 of your meeting pack. Um, we'll have the uh, written submission, so can I welcome uh, Dr. Stout? <coughs> Uh, to the meeting, we'll report by Hansard, publish a transcript on the committee webpage in due course. If you want to just give us a, an outline of your submission, and then we will pick it up with some questions. Thank you, Alan. Okay, good afternoon, Chair and, and members, and thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to the committee on this important piece of legislation uh, today. Uh, and can I apologise in advance for any overlap with what you've already been discussing and I've just been listening uh, to the previous discussion, but I will hopefully reflect the views from within the system that Thomas and Matt uh, have referenced just, uh, just before me. Uh, I'm going to be brief with my opening remarks as our comments are actually focused on the impacts of the legislation uh, on general practice rather than the detail of the legislation itself. Uh, firstly, it's important that we do put in record our own support for the purpose of this bill uh, and 100 per cent compensation for claimants is something that we do support. Uh, we also have no specific comments to make on the methodology used to set the discount rate proposed in this bill, um, but both the Scottish model and the model used in England uh, and Wales uh, would both have knock-on effects on general practice and on, on GPs. Uh, it is these impacts that we want to raise as part of the discussion on the bill, uh, and I'll limit my, my comments today to these. As you'll have noticed in our response uh, to the committee's call for evidence on the bill, general practitioners are the only doctors within the health and social care system who must provide and pay for their own indemnity insurance. Uh, and in fact, as we stand at the moment, uh, GPs in Northern Ireland are the only healthcare professionals in the entire UK NHS with these high personal costs. The cost of this varies depending on a number of factors, but can run to up to £12,000 per annum for a full-time equivalent GP. The cost of this indemnity insurance is in part dictated by the discount rate. When the rate is lower, indemnity costs are higher. It is clear from both this bill and the discount rate uh, have the potential to impact significantly uh, uh, on indemnity costs to our members. When the discount rate was lowered in England and Wales, it was forecast that the indemnity insurance rates may double or triple, uh, and some GP co colleagues were quoted increases from around £13,000 per year uh, to over £30,000 per year. Uh, and this forecast increase in England and Wales triggered the, uh, the automatic, the immediate introduction of a state-backed indemnity scheme, which now covers most of their GP indemnity. Uh, this was always proposed to be a UK-wide solution because it was a UK-wide problem, uh, but we had no minister at the time to implement it here. We've received welcome reassurances from some medical defence organisations that increases of this magnitude will not be the case immediately in Northern Ireland, uh, as they've been able to plan for a change to the discount rate here based on changes elsewhere. However, this absolutely cannot be guaranteed on a long-term basis. Uh, particularly in an instance where, where we may inadvertently end up with the interim discount rate for longer than an expected period of time. 
Uh, should we see these increases to the cost of medical indemnity insurance, it is inevitable that GPs will reduce their workload uh, or even leave the workforce altogether. And we've heard already about the impacts of COVID on the on the workforce. Uh, and this is at a time when we can absolutely not afford to lose GPs. Uh, and with the additional pressure that this would bring into a system that's already working under immense pressure. We fear that the costs of this magnitude are also a significant reason why it become difficult to recruit doctors uh, in training into general practice and also importantly to uh, recruit general practitioners from elsewhere to Northern Ireland. There's an additional risk that as a result of the change to the discount rate, even short term, that medical defence organisations may eventually be faced with no choice but to call in debt to cover historical liabilities. This could result in the closure and bankruptcy of practices and an inevitable reduction in the service to patients. Uh, I'd also like to note the impact of claims on GP time. Requests for notes and subject access requests nearly always now accompany claims. Uh, each of these is a significant undertaking for GPs. They take a lot of time and take time away from direct patient care. Aside from the workload associated with any claims, there's also the additional pressure and stress mounted on a doctor who faces these claims. Uh, with a lower discount rate, we'd expect the number of claims to rise, and therefore this pressure and workload will also rise. We acknowledge that the Department of Justice cannot take the impact of the discount rate on indemnity insurance and general practice into their reasoning for the methodology chosen to strike the rate. However, we believe that it is essential that the Departments of Health and Justice work together to ensure the effects of the change to the discount rate are not crippling to general practice and the wider health service in Northern Ireland. Our preference is the establishment of a compensation scheme for increased indemnity costs. A scheme such as this would mitigate the impact on GPs and general practice and allow continued practice on the same basis as we currently operate. It's also very important to general practice that the legislation is passed in this assembly mandate. We appreciate the tight timescales and the workloads of the committee, uh, but should this legislation not pass, we may face the consequences of the lower interim rate for quite some time. Once again, Chair, I'd like to thank the committee for their time today and for allowing me to highlight the issues uh, of great importance to our members. Uh, and I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, and it, it is in tune with the previous um, presentations, so I'm not going to, to labour uh, any points unnecessarily. So let me just uh, bring in Linda Dillon at this stage, and then Sinead Bradley. So, Linda. Thank you, Chair, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go over the, the points that I've previously made, um, and, and, but just to say again, Alan, we do have sympathy for the for the position that GPs are in, just to ensure you're aware of that obviously it's our job to make sure people get 100 percent compensation in terms of this framework but we absolutely have sympathy for the gps can i just ask you a quick question and and i have asked that we as a committee write to health minister to to ask around the indemnity issue and you've already said that there wasn't a minister in place however we have had a minister in place now for the last couple of years and i accept fully that we've been in the, in the middle of a pandemic and that has I have no doubt taken its its toll in terms of any other plans that any health minister would have had to to be fair to him. But have you have there been any conversations? Has the minister given any indication that it's something that the department would be um, willing to do in terms of coming to to an arrangement around state uh, or the department taking on responsibility for indemnity for GPs? And how quickly could that be done if it's something that was the intention? of UK wide, I mean, is, does it require primary legislation? Can it be, can it be done in, in, a, in a simpler way than that? I, I'm not sure, but if you can't answer, don't worry. I, it's prob there are probably more questions for the department, but just if you've had discussions, maybe you have the answers yeah. to those questions. Okay, yeah, and, and the answer to the first question is yes, we absolutely have had discussions. This has been an absolute priority for, uh, for my committee uh, for, the, for the past three years and really since uh, the, uh, the English and Welsh agreement. And, and in fact, it was a priority UK-wide for many years prior to that because I think, as you've already heard, the costs have been escalating very rapidly and have, becoming, have become uh, unaffordable uh, by, by our GPs everywhere. Um, 
So we have had uh, lengthy discussions with uh, with the department officials who, who are very understanding and have been very good and have pr created a, an options paper. Uh, I think a lot of the options paper and how we took it forward is uh, dependent on this uh, consultation uh, and the outcome of this and, and I think that has, has definitely had a, an impact uh, because whenever we first discussed it with the, the minister when he came in post, two things happened. Uh, one was this consultation started and second, uh, the, the pandemic hit uh, and I think that has, has distracted on, on both counts. Uh, the answer to your second question uh, is that I, I don't know, uh, my understanding is that primary legislation probably is required, which is why we weren't uh, able to, to progress it without a minister in place mm -hmm. uh, and without an executive in place. I don't know for definite, I, I would definitely need to, to check on that, but we have two options. One is to piggyback on the English and Wales scheme and the GP resolution scheme that they have in place. Uh, and it should be relatively easy, and I think we're we're relatively accustomed to to copying things that happen in, in England and Wales, particularly when they work well. Um, but the other uh, uh, option that could be instigated almost immediately, uh, literally overnight, uh, is a reimbursement of costs uh, scheme, uh, and that would be simply reimbursing costs that are currently there. So if a GP has a cost of twelve thousand pounds for sake of uh, argument or for sake of example, uh, that there is a reimbursement scheme. There already is a part of uh, that fee that is reimbursed, but it is uh, it is nowhere near 100%. It's, it's nowhere near 50% of the cost. Okay. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Chair, and I appreciate you allowing me to go down that line of question. I know it's outside of our remit, but as I said before, health is the remit of every single MLA in the Assembly, and, and we do want to try and ensure that we don't do anything that that harms our access to, to GP services. So th thank you, Alan, that's my question. Chair, thank you. Right, thank you, Linda. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alan. And I appreciate that the committee are tasked with putting on blinkers, if you like, in terms of setting this framework and aiming at the 100% compensation. And I, and I um, welcome that all parties are online with that, but if now isn't the time to hear from you, Alan, I'm not quite clear about when is. So I do appreciate your submission and um, and the detail that's in it. And it, ha it has got me wondering, um, in terms of how the relationship works here with GP practices and the Department of Health is distinctly different, as I understand from other parts that you are um, independent businesses. So does that, uh, differential in relationship have an impact on how any possible um, state indemnity might look. And secondly, you just made a point there about reimbursement, but just so I'm clear, um, you're talking about that you're buying indemnity cover from a third party, and then the reimbursement would come from the Department of Health. Is that where or were you talking about? Because I, I, I do wonder if there's um, a real clash there, you know, in terms of is the health service really able to pick that up? I do, I'm not really convinced that I see that as a solution. Alan, so maybe you could elaborate a wee bit more on that so I understand it better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So effectively, the the two options that are described, they both they both do the same thing, and and the difference between the two is who ultimately picks up the bill for the compensation. Um, so at the moment, we have a a system where we pay to an in, to a separate company, uh, one of the defence organisations, uh, and they then take. Uh, and, and again, uh, I think we heard a few uh, minutes ago just about them having that mutual fund. Um, so they then take the risk and the responsibility to, to pay the compensation from that mutual fund. Um, so they carry the financial accountability and the, and the financial risk. Um, to move to a state-backed scheme, we move that all to within the NHS. Now, the financial burden will still be there. Um, so the, the compensation uh, will be the same, regardless the le level of the compensation will be the same, regardless of which scheme you use. It's really who picks up the cost um, for paying for that. So the, the fundamental difference between the two is that with a personal indemnity scheme, we have to pay in advance. The company has to build up a, a pot uh, and be in a, a safe and a secure position to then be able to pay out. With a state-backed scheme, you can almost move to a 
case by case basis where the system as a whole takes that financial risk uh, on a yearly uh, basis for, for what is paid out and it will vary uh, from year to year. Whichever way you look at it, there's, there's going to be very significant financial impact uh, with both. Um, and just on your first uh, question, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we are independent contractors. General practices are independent contractors and have been since the onset of, of the NHS as a whole. Um, that benefits the NHS. Uh, we're we're um, getting feedback at the moment that it might not necessarily be benefiting practices because the problem is that we take the full responsibility for delivering uh, workload uh, and the demand, and the demand is now exceeding what we are able to, to uh, cope with. Um, but you're right, as part of, by being independent contractors, we then are responsible for various parts of effectively running a small business, uh, and indemnity is one of those. Um, but by being contracted by the NHS, which we solely are, um, there then has to be that shared accountability and responsibility uh, for, for the sustainability of, of that service. Okay, Alan. So, so, would you? Is it what you're suggesting? Then would be just a new contractual arrangement that that talks to that indemnity piece in it? No, we do. We don't even need a new contractual. It, it could become part of of the contract. So, in other words, just a, a sum of money that that covers costs, um, and and that already exists for premises, for example, uh, you know, and, and for for various other things that we provide. Uh, through, through practice, so it would be a simple addendum, uh, for want of a better expression, uh, to the contract, but it wouldn't need any sort of new complex contractual arrangement. appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. Um, well, if there's nobody else, can I thank you, Alan, very much for coming to the committee and taking your time with us today. It's much appreciated. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, that um, concludes the oral evidence sessions on the damages investment bill, and I do want to move uh, into the next one because there's a time pressure for for those members that are joining us. <clears throat> so, item seven is the the stocking bill oral evidence session. <clears throat> Excuse me, with the uh, the Dolce Vita project, uh, pages forty two to fifty three, and hopefully I'm able to uh, welcome some of the folks from uh, the project at this stage and we'll record this by Hansard and, and, and publish it in due course. So um, if I can just check then, I think it is uh, Donna Marie Logue and Andrea O'Hagan that are joining us. Yes, that's correct. Great. Well, listen, if I can hand over to yourselves at this stage and if you want to give us a, an outline just of your uh, presentation and then we'll move into some questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to start by thanking the Justice Committee and welcome the opportunity to speak to you today on the protection from stalking bill. And of course, everybody there behind the scenes, Alison and Chris, who have been working on the digital support administration to make sure this goes ahead. The Dolce Vita is a non-gender domestic abuse and parental alienation charity based here in Derry. I am the founder and director of services. We previously submitted our uh, evidence in writing. I hope you've had time to read it. So I'm going to elaborate on that today, taking a look at stalking behaviours, barriers, the misuse of a person's professional capacity, education, training requirements. And we're also going to be looking at the use of a child to spy on a parent, target a parent. It is a very common stalking and alienating strategy, which I will come to shortly. You will hear directly from Andrea, who is here beside me today. So I'd like to thank Andrea for joining us as well. And we're also joined, I'm not sure if you can see Becky, her gay dog. Becky's in the room with us. So we'd like to thank Becky for keeping us all nice and calm here today. Andrea is going to share with you her real life experience on stalking. To our own research conferences, beneficiary feedback, it came to us that there's a real lack of understanding and miscommunication understanding among harassment and stalking. There's also clear links with there's also clear links with um, domestic abuse and stalking. Many of the risk assessments completed with our team here on uh, stalking has identified indirect and direct harm to a person 
and also a person's child. Some of the things that were being said in the session was, my ex-partner was able to tell me where I was, what I was doing, what I was wearing, who I was with. I was then threatened if I was with that person again, I might not see my children. We know stalking behaviours to be noted around the monitoring of movements. So at this point, I would like to share with you a brief background in regards to your personal person's experience and how they came to us for support. So the person came to us, was unsure what was actually going on. Was it domestic abuse, coercive control, stalking? The later transpired was a combination of every form of abuse. What was the most common tactic that was being used was he was able to determine where she was. He had sent a message letting her know when she had left her sister's house. He sent a text message in regards to what she was wearing, who she was in town with that day, but also was able to tell her children was with her or not. It later transpired that he was using his professional capacity as a security man to monitor the movements. So with this, we would like to see captured as a code or an act and right into stalking to note employment status or professional capacity not to be used or misused to abuse and cause fear or alarm of substantial stress to a person or a children. We are aware that like, cyber stalking, the misuse of telecommunications is very commonly used, the creating of fake accounts. Alienating parents will use a child to spy or stalk the target of parents and report back to the alienated parent by making use of social media accounts, mobile devices. Only recently, I had a parent disclose to me in regards to how her son's mobile device was misused to always know her and her son's whereabouts. It transpired the app that was being used was Find My iPhone. The app gave her ex-partner details of where the mom son's locations were without their knowledge. It allowed him the opportunity to appear at locations that she didn't know how he had got there. The shopping centre, a hairdresser's, an appointment with her son. So the app was added to the son's device to monitor movements. Mandy Matthewson, Janet Haynes, Marcus Turnbull created a book, Understanding and Managing Parental Aid and Aiden Strategies. One of the things under the Family Violence Acts perpetrated by alienating parents includes and is documented monitoring movements, monitoring movements on social media, following the target of parents, or spying on the target of parents. Amy Beaker details the, parent, the Baker Strategies questionnaire. And one of the most commonly found answered questions is this. I was asked to spy on or secretly obtain information from or about the other parent and report back to them. We're very aware of cases where a child takes on the role of abuser when a person leaves an abusive relationship. Children are manipulated or intimidated to threaten, spy, cause harm. Alienating parents will use emotional manipulation, verbal abuse, financial abuse to maintain control over the children. When we look at examples of family violence that includes harmful acts of assault, abuse, intimidation, stalking and threats. Now we've done a lot of work on the domestic abuse bill and we know there's a crossover among them, but we're delighted to see that stalking is actually being separated within the bill and the very reason that we bring in the alienate strategies of children being used to spy on parents to monitor the movements and cause harm on parents. It's all acts of, st of stalking to cause fear. With this, I'd like to describe to you what was brought to us in regards to a parent's experience. What's wrong with you today, Billy? You're very quiet. I don't want to talk, Daddy. It sounds like there's something that's bothering you. Is everything okay? Stop asking me, Daddy. That's okay. Maybe later on tonight, when you're asleep, before you go to sleep, you could talk to Teddy. 
Teddy was a bear that was given to the child. The dad had given to the child, if he had any worries, he could tell Teddy, and then Teddy would tell, let Daddy know. The conversation that transpired later on included the people who are asking me questions. They want to know if you have a new girlfriend. They want to know if she's in your house. They want to know if I've ever seen her. They want to know if I'm in her company. I don't like the questions. I just want them to stop. Everybody wants to know about you, but they don't ask about me. This is a form of domestic abuse, coercive control, but most importantly, stalking, because the child has been used to monitor, to spy on, and for the information to be used by the other parent to cause harm. But the child is directly and indirectly being harmed. I'm going to pass you now over to Andrea, and Andrea is going to share with you her understanding of what happened to her in regards to stalking. And she's also going to give some details in regards to recommendations that she would like to see within this bill before passing back to myself. Andrea. Hello there. Um, as a blind and disabled person, um, the instance of stalking that occurred to me um, was, first incident was things being moved about by the abuser, which caused me a lot of stress and pressure and anxiety. Um, pressure in raising my kids, whether I was doing the right job, um, and bringing them up. The second incident, which was a bit more frightening, um, was when the stalker came to the house unannounced and came in the back door of my house to take my kids off me, which I was not aware of by authorities, which he said they were given permission for it to do, but it was not the case. I had to contact the police where they came out and took a statement. It was extremely scary and frightening and a lot of fear in me when I'm in my own home. The third instance of stalking, which was probably the worst, um, when I was training with my dog, I was in an area where I knew pretty well and he had found out that I was out training with the dog. I parked across the main road and came over and started shouting abuse at me of because I'd left the kids with friends and he should have known this. Um, all these incidents are quite frightening, fearful, stressful. Um, need to stop living your own life. Um, as a blind person, or disabled blind person, um, I would love to see when the bill is produced be put into format, formats that are accessible, um, such as large print, braille, and audio, and also that the bill is to be put through on mobile phones on an app, that the app is accessible for the voiceover that is on iPhones and iPads and Androids. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. And I, I know that it was stressful for you at the time. And one thing I'd also like to point out, while that was happening, it was also causing stress to Becky, who was the new guide dog who was being trained. And at that time of trying to find a way home, they only get to know the locations. So it had a very significant impact on the both of them in regards to his unannounced appearance and causing that a harm. We're delighted to hear your recommendations on the accessibility of information share, and we hope that you take that on. And as you've heard from Andrea, we would really like the consideration to include in the meaning of conduct to make use of a person's disability to cause fear, alarm, or substantial stress to be included. By not, it is creating barriers for those reporting. And we already know there is low levels of prosecution within stalking, and they seem to rank lower down the line. So it is important that the views of those registered disabled are taken on board. As a lot of the feedback received was, disabilities appear not to be taken into consideration when stalking. 
that's not good enough. And we need to see that changed. Another barrier that parents have come back to us with is parental alienation is not fully really understood among professionals. And they believe, therefore, it's placing children a potential and actual risk of them being weaponized to use to be stalked and obtain information about another parent. It's also reported that various professionals, uh, example, police officers, have limited information and knowledge around it. So it is extremely important that a great training is fit for purpose, delivered by experts to recognize narcissistic personality disorder, coercive control, the various parenting styles, a person's ability to co-parent, parenting capacity, and most importantly, ensuring they understand and that they can capture the voice of the child to ensure any plans is put in early to reduce any risks of stalking behaviours to be escalated or children to be used to cause harm. There needs to be clear resource pathways in place to ensure the safeguarding of all. As you've heard from Andrea, accessible information. A failure to identify and deliver adequate training and accessible information, not only to those professionally and to the parents and people involved, the public, frontline workers, mental health, legal professionals, social workers, will result only in the increased domestic instance, stalking, escalation of serious child protection issues to include stalking, domestic abuse, parental alienation. A lack of expert training will result in low prosecutions. We are aware of the high, high risks of harm and how they are significant increased when a person leaves an abusive relationship. When a person decides to leave, there needs to be excessive supports in place as they are constantly living in a perpetual state of fear, wondering what will happen next. The children also are in fear. What will they be asked to do next? As I'm sure you will agree, stalking is increasing. The more information that people can access, the better awareness, the more possibility we will have to bring change. This legislation is extremely important. It is vital for all of those victims, including our children. Our hopes will be able to our hopes will be able to online access to stock and information, a mandatory stock measure, the implementing of the stocking tagging system, early intervention models put out through online workers who will understand all risks, including the risks associated with leaving domestic abuse relationships that cover parental alienation strategies, such as spying on and using the child to monitor the movements of a person. We would like to see video animations to include the voiceovers to meet the needs of those disabled. Accessible information, as Andrea has pointed out, in real, large print and a voiceover. I will close with you now with expressions and quotations described to me of a person's experience of stalking. I was left feeling powerless. No one helped us. I was in a hopeless situation. I wanted my life to end, the pain to stop. Please protect me. Please do something. Don't let the stalkers get away with this. They have gotten away long enough. Please protect our children. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll pass back now to yourselves. For any questions? Great, thank you, and um, thank you for, for sharing that with us, and in particular that your personal testimony and what Andrea said to us, and, and also Donna Maria, the, 
the different um, stories that you've been able to relate to us because that does have an impact and it brings it home to everybody as to exactly why this legislation is so important that we get it right. If I can just ask one, one question and then I'll, I'll bring in members um, at that stage. I suppose it's, it's what, if there was one thing we could do to provide the best possible support to the victims of stalking, from your own experience, you know, what, what would that be? The training and the education is significantly important. And, and also the awareness of all this, the accessible information. A lot of those we worked with uh, spoke to us and says the first point of contact would have been the internet and trying to come to terms with what is actually happening. So they wanted clear understanding of what is stalking behaviours and links to resources to support them and also for the professionals so that they can access that information to create assessment models so that they can roll out or to get in early. So the information and making it accessible is the, the priority and ensuring that the information that is given out is true and factual and that the services are also supported to deliver on the ground to support those that's coming. We don't want to be seeing people overwhelmed, so the services also will need support to deliver. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can bring in Linda Dillon and then Sinead Bradley. Linda? Thank you, Chair, and thank you to, to both of you, Don Marie. And just, I suppose, first of all, to make the point, I would agree, and, and I think the whole committee would agree in relation to the training and education piece. It's vital. It's the same in terms of domestic abuse, and, and the same will be. Um, I think we probably have the same focus on that particular issue in relation to this bill as well. So uh, just to give you that reassurance, first of all, Maria, and then second, the, the question that I have is just in relation to the proposed amendment, Don Maria, um, and I'm wondering, and I think we should ask the department, first of all, Chair, is, is that specifically already captured or or do we need you know do we need to see on the face of the bill do we need that amendment and, and if it's the case that that it's something that we think we should do then i think the committee should at least be looking at that Maria. so just to give you that reassurance we should we will look at that um but but i do think we need to ask the the department in the first instance just in relation to the um of the, the format of information and, and it being accessible. Is it isn't it the case at the minute that that's not taken into consideration in terms of, of leg legislation? Do you know, Don Maria, is, is, is there accessible things already available through departments? I, I thought it was, but if it's not the case, then we need to certainly need to look at that. It was more that when Andrea herself was seeking for helping that and having to talk into various apps and maybe being changed from one place to another. So there was problems with not only the, the, the tech, technology yeah. first and foremost before even being able to access the information, but it's also been very clear that maybe with the department would need a, 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 its own very open site on stalking, just specific to stalking, and then ensuring that the first point that it allows the person the option to uh, talk, that it already is set up, that it speaks, and then you switch it off if you don't need it, so that the person that is blind is not trying to scroll, trying to find ways to get into that information, that it is automatically on voiceover and they, with the option to change. We see a, a lot of us don't actually have that, or uh, Andrew, uh, what's the name of the device set up in your phone that supports you? Um, what's the device? It's on my phone. is on iPhone, but it might be on some of the Android, it might be on all the devices, so it's ensuring that there's a broad range of uh, accessible information for the technology that people have these days. Yeah. 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 Maybe we should just ask the department what um, sort of consultation whenever they're they're setting up these um, 
you know, how information is disseminated, what consultation do they do with um, the representatives of, of disability groups? I think maybe that's at, at least the very, very least we should be we should be doing. I think it, it is important and there's no way you could have a, an understanding of how difficult it can be to access some of this information unless you have that lived experience as, as you talked about. So I, th I think there are a couple of things in that that we should take forward as a as a committee. And just to thank you again, Don Marie and Andre, for for giving your personal testimony. Very yeah. much appreciated. And certainly thank helpful. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and and we'll take note of that point as well about following that up. Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Donna Maria and Andrea. And I have to say, very disciplined Becky because know there's a bit of feedback there so you've, your, your training has done done well um, Andrea but in terms of I have to really um, commend you on this submission because I, I think it's a very distinct one you know it, it does um, hone in on areas that really could add value to this bill and it has given me and I know um, I've spoken offline and away from committee on you this Andrea it, it definitely hasn't given it's given food for thought in terms of the whole disability vulnerability stalkers um i suppose like you know we talked about domestic abuse and coercive control they're very good at framing around the person their vulnerability whatever that might look like or is um, and i can only imagine andrea how frightening that must be you know the the story we relayed um but the the issue then um around children as well i think it would need to explore a wee bit deeper with you but I, I was I only actually um, was doing a piece on another issue entirely and it came to my attention um, and I did do a bit of work in the past I have to declare in terms of around visual impairment and disability but how the world's moved on and so much was online and also how we write online has changed so the use of emojis you know, can be a real challenge in terms of voice over a voice reader. And, and I'm not suggesting the, the legislation will have emojis, but some of the information sites or the forums that people use, I think it need to get into um, just the general thinking of people that, you know, if you're there to create an informative voice, and um, that we, we have to write in a different style sometimes online, um, because that whole accessibility piece has to be explored I think more thoroughly and fully and I do take the point why it's important Donna Marie you said in this particular piece of legislation but I can't help but wonder if while you're revealing it to us rightly here today it's something that every piece of legislation should be available Andrea to you you know because there are unforeseen circumstances ahead where you, you should have as much access um, to that as I have or anybody else so I, I, I do think maybe we um, we should chair follow up on that um, in terms of not just the justice um, but all committees and legislation processes and ask some very serious questions about the access uh, accessibility piece but I do agree what you said I, I fully agree that the training and education piece um, is is critical in this. But I would ask, Andrea, if I may, um, have you found engagements on a broader on a broader level, access to government information? How do you find that? Is it, Andrea? Would you, how would you rate it at the moment? Extremely difficult. I would go to a close friend or colleague, <laughs> or the the adults leader have been very helpful towards me, like on access and information and laws and legislation and of course there is no accessible format out there for people who are blind to go and do their own research. One of the things we did was an informal feedback session with Andrea and a few other people with various disabilities that to support us with our online presence. It was one of the things that came up and we received a number of messages 
uh, from uh, general other people uh, that they couldn't read the graphics. So we made the point then, always writing, if the graphics is something we always put it above. So listening to uh, Jen, her experiences allowed us to adapt our services particularly delivering of training and always to include them because inclusion was another uh, issue that came up with various uh, training and accessibility they attend in that uh, as well. Because Andrew would have came out and sat in the at the beginning of 2016 and we quite uh, you know, quickly realised that we had not included how uh, to create a safety plan for somebody who is blind. So part of that uh, included Andrea, how you know, using the gig dog, senses, and different uh, hearing stuff, helped us to adapt our services to support her better. So she'd be a great help for the department as well. And I know I'm just uh, putting you in there, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you will. And even as well, the experiences from the children and sharing their voices is here within this fall as well as too many children are being used to monitor the movements of other parents, grandparents, and it has to stop. And we need most to look at the training around parental alienation strategies and have that included as well. It, is, it has to be included to safeguard all. We're not just talking about man, woman, we're talking about everyone with all able to love. We have to really look at the expert level of training that everybody understands that we bring all our heads together and create an assessment model with parental alienation advocates, domestic abuse advocates, sexual violence, disability. Let's come together. It's time that was done to incorporate it. A huge assessment that can be put across our region that we're all happy with, that we can get in early, ensure to protect harm from everyone. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that, and, and I, um, Andrew, while I'm glad to hear that you do have that support network around you that can help you access, I don't think maybe that's good enough, you know, um, and perhaps this bill is an opportunity for us to champion that need, because it needs to be on every bill, as far as I'm concerned, and, and all public information, and if it's not there, we need to fix it. Basically, I think it's on all of us um, to, to do that scrutiny and any legislation and accessibility to that legislation. That's as good as it is if people don't know their rights or how to access and then it may as well not exist you know, for many people. So I think it, it was a very, very worthwhile submission and I'm glad you made it and I particularly appreciate, appreciate you being there, Andrea, um, to just put life to that. So thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Paul Frey. i just say, as Sinead has said, and echo her sentiments around the submission. It was very, very good, Donna, uh, Marie, and, and, and it was good to hear from you again. Uh, just, just to the point you make about the use of a child, or any other family member for that matter, I think that's vitally important. Uh, and I, I think that we've been through this. Uh, with regards to the domestic violence piece. Uh, so the committee is very tuned in to the use of a child, even when a child isn't uh, knowledgeable themselves or aware that they're being used. Uh, so that's very important uh, that I think we include this into this bill. But it's not only a child uh, or another family member for that matter. It could be an intermediary whereby you have some third party, some total stranger, uh, being uh, either volunteering or being employed by the perpetrator um, to get around some law. Uh, so I think we, I would like to explore that more. Have you any ideas around that where you have a complete stranger, third party? Well, what, what came up for us, and again, it was uh, used to monitor movements and use in their professional capacity where we had somebody uh, accessing CCTV image. We had a person who used their job as a taxi man uh, to let the person know when the children was in the home, when the children was leaving, if they were attending school. Uh, we had uh, extended family members being used to see, uh, advise if they had attended birthday parties. Uh, a lot of the time, the, 
the, the children, uh, the information uh, that's been sourced on the children to feed back and to be used sometimes within the family court. Uh, one of the things came up with us was that the child was used uh, to ask about what they did at the weekend, how much money did they spend, what activities were they on, and then within the court a number of weeks later, the father was asked to disclose his uh, finances and, and it transpired. But you took the children on here, you took them on here, you should be able to increase the child maintenance. So that's just some of the ways that, 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 that they're trying to manipulate and intimidate to get information, obtaining the information. And yes, there's a crossover in the domestic abuse as well. However, this is stalking behaviours, monitoring, spying on stalking, which is very difficult. It does need to be implemented. There's, um, there's other, um, another story that's just, uh, sorry, loved experience of somebody just came into my mind where uh, just a general conversation had met somebody in the street, was asking how they were doing, and it came to light that, oh, I had met such such, he was your ex partner. He was saying, you're doing this, that you have a new partner, that you have moved on. The person was very shocked that somebody she worked with, a colleague, knew all this information about her when she hadn't even told her immediate family that she had a new partner. So this also showed again that the uh, somebody was monitoring, watching, and feeding back information. Okay, thank you. And, and, and the other point I would make then around the person's disability to cause fear, alarm, and substantial distress on the person. I think that's very critical too, and something we probably, uh, without your submission, we wouldn't have, have thought about. So thank you for that. But is is there a balance here between someone trying to be helpful around someone's disability, somebody wanting to assist, and and that that's where the reasonableness test comes in? Yes. Uh, is there a grey area there that we need to be aware of? Now I get it that if someone's going in entering a premises or a street and moving furniture or street furniture about to really cause distress to to a blind person that that's that's really horrible and and of course we should capture this but there's this balance of reasonableness so if someone with a disability needs care and attention or assistance from people then do we have to be careful of how we frame that clause one hundred percent, and I don't think we would have all the answers now. But it would be important to get a group of people around the table and and see what they are already using, and listen to again the experiences and try to see what is the gaps and build the framework around around that. But as I say, I wouldn't have the full expertise, and I'm very open for interagency involvement in this because we don't have everything. And Andrew, it's not everyone will be blind to expect to know there be other disabilities, wheelchair, the, the, the hearing, there's also the invisible disabilities. So it is, um, I think there might be opening a can of worms <laughs> of, of what, what actually might be needed. But yes, a reasonable person's test and, and, and breaking that down to have practical guidance to get the support in place to really benefit those frontline and, and work at the community grassroots organisations as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, there's no other members indicating, so that just leaves me to thank you, Donna Maria and uh, Andrea, for joining with us, and thank you for the work that you do do um, up in the thank Northwest so as well, and your insight has been very helpful, and uh, I just want to put on record my appreciation for all that you do do, and thank you. Appreciate your time and commitment to the bill as well. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. You. Okay, thank you. Okay, members. Um, so we've made good progress there just this morning. We're probably about 15 minutes just behind schedule. So we're going to break um, for half an hour and we will recommence then at 2 p.m. So if we adjourn for 30 minutes and then our next evidence session. Uh, we'll be again back on the stocking bill and it'll be from the Law Society. So members, I'll see you at two o'clock. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Okay, members, welcome back to a meeting of the Justice Committee and we will move into our next oral evidence session on the protection from stocking bill. So 
hopefully we'll be joined by Brian Archer, who's representing the uh, Northern Ireland Law Society. And a copy of the written submission is in your meeting packet, pages 55 through to 58. So can I um, welcome Brian to the meeting? We will record this um, by Hansard and publish that then on our web committee page in due course. So Brian, I'm going to hand over to you just to give us a brief outline of the Law Society's submission and then we'll pick that up. Oh, okay. Brian's actually not with us. While Brian is joining us, rather than waste time, let me jump to agenda item 10, um, which is the damages return on investment bill. It's a report by the Assembly Examiner Statutory Rules. So members at our meeting on the 18th of March, the committee agreed to refer the delegated powers memorandum for this bill to the Examiner Statutory Rules. We requested a report highlighting any delegated powers that she wished to draw our attention to. In particular, the committee requested views on whether it was appropriate for each of the powers to be left to subordinate legislation <coughs> rather than including them in the bill itself, and whether the choice of assembly pr procedure for each is the most appropriate. The examiner has provided her report and has indicated that she is satisfied with the delegation of those powers provided for in the bill as being appropriate, and the exercise of these powers is, in each case, subject to the appropriate assembly scrutiny. So members are asked to note the advice uh, from the examiner of statutory rules on the delegated powers in the damages bill. Unless any more information is needed, we will duly note it. Okay, we, um, I'll take the next item then. Uh, item 11 is the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, the proposed LCM. The committee had been considering the provisions within the Police Crime and Sentencing and Courts Bill for which legislative consent from the Assembly would be required and previously agreed to seek the views of the AG um, for Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and the uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People on the provisions to be included in the LCM, including compatibility with the European Convention on Human Rights. At our meeting on the 15th of April, the committee noted that the Children's Commissioner had advised that she would not be providing a response to the committee on the issue and agreed to forward the responses from the AG and the Human Rights Commission to DOJ for comment on the issues raised. The committee also wrote to the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains for its views on the issues raised by the Human Rights Commission regarding the potential implications of the provisions relating to the location of human remains on the work of the um, ICLVR and a possible overlap in jurisdiction. Responses have now been received from uh, the ICLVR and the Department, which includes comments where appropriate from the Home Office to recommendations of the Human Rights Commission. The ICLVR has advised that it is an implementation body for legislation uh, that was brought forward by UK and Irish governments and suggests to be more appropriate to seek the views of the NIO and DOJ in the Republic on the potential implications of the provisions of the Bill in respect of the uh, location of human remains. So if members are content, we will ask the Department of Justice for any details of any engagement, either by it or the Home Office, uh, with the Northern Ireland Office and the Department of Justice in Ireland, on the powers to seize evidence relating to the location of human remains outside of criminal investigation in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, including potential implications on the work of the ICLVR and whether there is a possibility of uh, overlap in this uh, juris jurisdiction. If members are content, we will we will write to that effect. And furthermore, if members then are content that at this stage we would note the information provided in relation to the points raised by the AG for Northern Ireland and the Human Rights uh, Commission, unless there's any other points in respect of that matter, we will duly note it and write accordingly. Rachel. Thank you, Chair, um, and certainly happy to do those things. But just if, in, uh, with regard to the responses that were um, given to the questions that were asked, I, there's a lot of it there that hasn't answered the questions. Just from reading it, you know, there was a conference. There, a question was asked about um, the statutory code of practice from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission in relation to data extraction from ele electronic devices and in consultation with individuals and re relevant organisations in Northern Ireland. And the response is, 
that they've already begun engagement. Well, clearly not with the Human Rights Commission if they have you know, said that. So I would certainly, I have a number of questions just stemming from the answers that were given because I don't think they were actually answered properly. Um, the Home Office has said about, you know, gun engagement with stakeholders, but we don't know who they are, when this is, and whether or not codes of practice would be consulted on at this stage. So I certainly, I, I would maybe, if, if, depending on, on how the other members of the committee would feel about this, but um, send in the answers that we've got to the Human Rights Commission to see if they are content with that or if they've any other comments on it. I just certainly don't think those questions have actually been answered in any any way that gives me the assurance um, that they, the concerns have been addressed. Okay, um, Linda Dillon. Sorry, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree with Rachel and would s support a proposal that um, those answers be forwarded on to the Human Rights Commissioner. Um, that's really all. It's just to say that I, I support what Rachel's saying and the fact that um, she would have some concerns around the, the answers that we're getting. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, let, let's do that. I'm happy for that to happen. So we, we will action that as well. Okay. Um, Brian's still not in, so we'll just keep going. Item 12 on the agenda then. Um, in terms of a, a statutory rule, it's subject to the draft affirmative procedure and it removes the multiple conviction rule by which Access NI is required to automatically disclose all convictions relating to an applicant for standard and enhanced checks where that applicant has more than a single conviction held on their criminal record. This will bring the filtering system into line with the UK Supreme Court judgment in January 2019, which found that the disclosure of all convictions held on the criminal record where an individual had more than a single offence was disproportionate and would not comply with Article 8 of the uh, ECHR. Uh, the Committee agreed at our meeting on the 1st of October that we were content with the proposal for the STAT rule and subsequently noted at our meeting on the 13th of May this year correspondence from the Department advising that the delay in bringing forward the rule following the Committee's consideration was a result of difficulties in agreeing its wording, which had been resolved. So the Department has confirmed that there has been no change to the policy content of the rule since the SL1 was considered by the Committee and the examiner of stat rules has raised no concerns relating to the technical aspects of the statutory rule uh, in her report dated the 18th of May. So if members are content then uh, with the statutory rule, um, I need to formally put the question. Rachel, I see your hand up. That's maybe from the, the last time, is it? Okay, that's okay. Um, so then I'll put the, the question formally that the Committee for Justice considered SR, the Police Act 1997 uh, Criminal Record Certificates Relevant Matters Amendment Order in Northern Ireland 2021 and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, we'll outline the views of the Committee then in the debate on the statutory rule uh, whenever it is uh, disclosed. Okay, members, I think Brian has now joined us, so um, I will go back on the agenda then. Uh, okay, Brian, hopefully you can hear the committee okay. If Brian can. Sure, yep, great. Okay, Brian, if you want to just give us a brief overview of your submission on the Protection and Stalking Bill, and then we'll uh, pick that up with some questions afterwards. Thank you. Yes, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Royal Society. It's very much appreciated. I know you've had a very busy schedule um, today. Uh, the Society welcomes the, the work that's being carried out um, to date on the bill. We're very supportive um, of it. It's clearly in the past there's been a lacuna in, in the uh, appropriate legislation, and the, the Homes of Domestic Violence legislation wasn't didn't always cover because stalking can obviously take place when there's no relationship between the the the, the, um, the perpetrator and and the person um, who's the victim in the case um the, the, the British crime survey showed in 2019 that um, 1.4 million people in the previous 12 months have been victims of stalking and uh, indeed um the, the, the British crime survey felt that we saw stalking victims were five million people um and the across the country uh, were involved 
that that's, is, that's taken it on now. In contact, you're talking 30,000 people, which is horrendous. The study which was carried out by Queen's University, and I know the department um, have been working on this legislation since 2016, but the academic study showed um, in 2016 that there could be 100 incidents um, before the matter referred to the police, which is absolutely horrendous um, for the victims concerned. Uh, thankfully, now uh, this will be on, hopefully on the statute books quite soon. Um, we are obviously, um, this mirrors the Scottish uh, legislation, which has been enforced since 2010, where there's a list um, of, of, of um, behaviour which falls into the legislation and has to be welcomed. Obviously, the list is not exhaustive, um, but as a guide in relation to that, we've also uh, welcomed the uh, provision in respect of um, abusive, threatening behaviour, um, where the behaviour falls short uh, of stalking, but obviously falls into a criminal category um, of its own. Uh, we are also um, welcome the, the fact that it's not just summary only offences that will, will be dealt with here, that where well, there's repeat offending, there's aggra aggravation, uh, aggravating features of a case, that it's appropriate the case be dealt with on, um, on the Crown Court. Um, obviously, the protection uh, on the bill, which prevents um, a defendant cross-examining directly um, a victim, is to be welcomed. And that's similar to other uh, legislation in relation to sexual offences. Um, in relation to the uh, the revisions covering, I think that one we think that this is extremely important that um, the legislation allows the chief constable um, to make an application to the court, even without a conviction. Um, but where there's evidence of, of stalking behaviour, but maybe falls short um, of meeting the prosecution test, that they can apply for an order, a um, stalking prevention order. Um, and obviously, uh, there is a balancing, to, um, there's a, a balance, a balancing of factors to be taken into account, and that a perpetrator obviously has rights um, of their own, and those are protected in addition to right, Article 8 rights, rights to work, rights for education. And Whilst it may be concerning that obviously this legislation will also um, come into play in respect of youth courts, and um, children as young as 10 can face um, prosecution and also be, be liable to stalking prevention orders. But we'd like, we'd like to think that um, obviously work young people who fall in this category and because of the whole social media um, situation, uh, a lot of young people do not fully realise the implications when they're involved in cyberbullying and we hope that education and work can be carried out in this area in school so they're fully aware of the consequences of their actions uh, which can impact upon them for, you know, really in, into adulthood. Um, and in this regard, the third sector um, is particularly welcome the work that's carried out in respect of, um, I work, have worked in the past and still do with the food use to carry out individual work uh, with young people. So they avoid such behaviour. Ignorance is not, unfortunately, ignorance is not a defence in law, and they can find themselves put on a register. Um, and obviously, it is important that whilst there's a criminal legislative framework, it's also, um, as I say, extremely important that education also takes place in the schools. So to avoid young people being criminalised because of this behaviour, and obviously that would be beneficial to avoid victims in the future. Uh, is there anything else um, you wish me to, to cover? No, Brian, I'm happy to pick things up um, and members, I'm sure, will as well in, in some of the questions. So thank you. Thank you for mm -hmm. that um, uh, overview. Uh, just a couple for me to start with. In terms yep. of the provisions around the additional offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, and that's in clause two, in terms yes. of being useful, uh, is it useful or has it the potential to be used instead of pursuing the actual stalking offence? Well, the legislation allows um, the department to issue guidance to, to the P PSNI, and obviously they're working in conjunction with um, the PPS in relation to that. And obviously every every circumstances will be looked at and see whether it meets the prosecution test. And obviously it, it depends on the evidence of, the, of, a, given, of a given case, but um, there obviously is a crossover between I mean, the stock, the abusive and threatening behaviour may be a court to, to convict somebody um, of that lesser offence. Um, 
especially in a situation where there's not a course of conduct, there's not more than there's not two incidents or more. So that would be more appropriate in those circumstances. But every case will have to be looked at by the prosecution service and not be the court. Okay. Thank you. If I can just bring in some members then, and I might come back on some of the questions. But uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Brian, for coming to the committee. Um, the first point I want to pick up on is you talk in your submission around the, the need for training of PSNA, and, and, and you'll get no pushback from this committee in relation to training. That, that's for absolute certain. But one, one of the issues that has been previously raised by the committee, and specifically um, by Rachel Woods, um, is around training of the legal profession and the judiciary and yeah. obviously that's not something that we can legislate for and, and you know that, that that's outside of our control and so it should be no. that legal profession is, is. but I haven't said that what, what is how, how does that work I suppose is what I'm trying to establish is there any kind of uniformity in terms of training whenever new legislation comes in or is it up to each individual or each practice or how does that Work and then obviously the judiciary is a separate thing. All right. Obviously, I'm here today on behalf of the law society. I can't speak to the great, but I do have experience. I'm a deputy district judge and have been for 14 years. So I, I am of okay, um, of the training available. But if I did first with the law society, the law society um, through their um, continued professional development um, run courses every year. Uh, it obviously has been difficult uh, this year, but they have a Zoom platform. Uh, indeed, the 96 this year they provided 96 hours um, of training to solicitors on uh, across a whole wide range um, of civil and criminal uh, family law le legislation. But certainly, the, the law society um, um, I'm aware of Jennifer Ferguson, um, who's the manager of professional development training in law society, and um, she will be very on top of this. And she whenever this that before this legislation comes into force, and uh, no doubt the law society will run um, CBD courses. Um, on this area, and we'll look to invite um, people from the PSNI and also the PS because obviously there's you no, know, we're covering the same area, um, and it's important there's collaboration within the justice sector in respect of that. As far as the judiciary concerned, the Judicial Studies Board um, mm -hmm. run regular training sessions, and they will link in with the Department of Justice in relation to that. And provide that to all, to all judiciary through all the tiers from from magistrates through to the courts of appeal. Okay, appreciate that, Brian. It's, it's helpful just to know that. And I mean, as I say, we can't make that mandatory through through legislation, and neither should we be able to, given that they're separate organisations. But it will, it is important, and it's important at every level that the training is right because we. I mean, we've said it and. I think it's worth repeating that the legislation isn't worth the paper it's written on unless people understand how to use it. No, definitely. No, definitely. And I have no doubt that the, um, I mean, the presiding judge, Judge Bagnell, will also um, be yeah. involved in it as well with, with the lower judiciary. Okay, listen, I, I really appreciate that. Just, you, you had also raised the um, potential for the hybrid charge as opposed to the summary charge. Yep. And... Um, well, the legislation allows, the legislation covers indictment as well, but hopefully when the actual bill becomes into law, obviously that will remain, and we are very supportive of that, because okay. uh, summary offences, summary judges are limited by, mm -hmm. by the nature of their, of their office, and they can only impose sentences up to 18 months um, for consecutive offences, um, where obviously it doesn't apply in, in the Crown Court, the Crown Court mm -hmm. judge, um, on, upon conviction or plea of guilty. Um, the, sen the sentences are extremely high in respect of um, harassment compared to the magistrate's court level, 10 years on indictment um, for stalking and five years in respect of the, the lesser offence of intimidating, intimidating abusive behaviour. Okay, I appreciate that. And then just um, the rehabilitation period then being factored into the protection. Um, we were concerned that that seemed to be missing from the legislation. Are you, talk, are you talking about in relation to the orders or in relation to the offence? I, I suppose I'm just trying to clarify that because the orders obviously aren't, act, you don't have to be found guilty you know, of a criminal offence and rehabilitation is linked to 
a criminal offence, am I right in saying? So is this just in relation to the actual... They may come out and be on an enhanced um, check, criminal justice check. Um, there may be there may be more information provided in respect to this. There are obviously civil application for breach, breach of the orders of criminal offence, in respect mm. of the stalking prevention orders. Yeah. Okay. And, and we, I mean, we have... Uh, it has been raised by a number of organisations, and I agree that the six month maximum is not long enough, that you need the 12 month maximum. And like any other sentence, the, the maximum is probably very, very rarely going to be used. Um, and look, just again, the, you've, you've talked the need for resourcing. Like, you'll get no pushback from, from this committee on that, but it absolutely needs to be resourced. Can I just ask one final question? I know that um, Gemma Dolan had asked this question last week of, of some of the organisations. Are you aware, because you've, you've talked about the, the you know the programmes and the need for those rehabilitation programmes, are you aware if there are any or are there many? Are there enough even to, to out there to deal with? Are we talking about we need additional resourcing around this issue? And, probation, and, probation will undoubtedly have to do a bid mm -hmm. to the Department of Justice in respect mm -hmm. of increased resources. Um, they're very under-resourced. Um, mm -hmm. they their their role has expanded greatly um, yes. over the last ten years. Never mind going back from, from the imposition of hussy probation orders in the nineties mm -hmm. um, of the two thousand and eight. Um, I would imagine, I'm not aware of the civic. I mean, probation can also refer um, offenders on to third work with third parties. I'm aware of Nexus um, work with people in that in, in Hyde Bank and who were also victims um, as well as perpetrators. Of sexual abuse, so I imagine the probation will use those things as well to bring in expertise from outside their organisation. Mm -hmm. Work offenders, it's very important that that rehabilitative work is done because hopefully it will stop people reoffending and creating more victims in the future. I mean, this is a very insidious offence. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you will be aware um, of the case of um, the journalist Miss Mal Malice, yes. um, who suffered 25 years, unbelievable, 25 years um, of abuse, um, uh, being a victim from this person, and nobody wants to, ever that to be repeated. Um, and obviously, there's there's a, a great need for this legislation in, uh, in this jurisdiction. No, I, I appreciate that, and thank you, and, and I agree with you. The probation board is severely under resourced, and when we look at this year this year's budget. And the plans that the probation board had to improve their services, they'll be lucky if they're able to maintain their services, never mind improve them, and that's through no fault of their own. Um, no, appreciate that. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul Frew and then Sinead Bradley. Chair, uh, thank you, Brian, for your attendance here. Uh, thank you. Can I centre on Clause 2? Uh, the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour. You've already touched on it and I've read through your submission around this. Can I ask why you think there's a need for Clause 2? I think there's there's a need for Clause 2 because not all behaviour um, will fall into the bracket of, of stalking. Um, especially, you know, if there's not if there's, if there's, if there's not evidence to the record of standard beyond reasonable doubt in respect of um, committing two or more offences, then it's open to the court if, if they only have clear evidence of one offence occurring. Especially, I mean, the court has to bear in mind if they, they have to consider the evidence on, on issues of credibility, but they also have to consider issues of identification possibly as well, because you could be relying on a victim giving evidence of what they believe they're being followed or the perpetrator is, you know, is at a venue where they are, but they could be possibly they could be mistaken on, on that. So. It may not be. It may not always be necessary for a court, um, or able for a court, to obviously convict the person and um, based on the evidence. Then they have, obviously judges have 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 to balance um, the evidence. Um, I get no. It's not a question of simply convicting people. You have that they have a, a, a duty um, to ensure people get a fair trial. And if the evidence that isn't, if the evidence isn't isn't satisfactory, then the person won't be convicted. But they may, Can I they, ask may, you? they may have been they may be guilty obviously of one incident, uh, which would fall into the lower charge. But so, I, I, and excuse me for ignorance, but can they not at that point be charged uh, for another offence that's already on the statute book, or do they need to actually keep within this 
bill and the clause is contained within this bill. It's open. When, to the does judge. that work? Okay, it's open to the judge um, to convict. To if, if they find them, they're not guilty of stalking, but it's open to the judge under the legislation to find them guilty of a lesser charge if the if the evidential test is met. You know is I mean? there, is, so, so this 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 new offence is, is described as a person A commits an offence if A behaves in a threatening or abusive manner. Yes. Uh, the behaviour would be likely to cause a reasonable person to suffer fear and alarm. Uh, it intends by the behaviour to cause fear or alarm or is reckless as to whether the behaviour causes fear or alarm. Surely, surely our common assault offence is covered there or even harassment. Well, common assault is media fear of violence, not necessarily alarm. Um, the common assault is a very specific offence under, under section 42 of the offences against the person act 1861. Um, you don't have to have you don't and I obviously you're you're right that you don't have to have physical contact to be guilty of the common assault. You put the other person in fear. But um I would say alarm is less than than, than fear of immediate violence. It's a it's a lower threshold. Okay, that that's very interesting. Why do we why do you think that they have included the uh the recklessness in clause two C where they say A intends to be hit to by the behaviour to cause fear or alarm or is reckless as to whether the behaviour causes fear and alarm, but they don't include recklessness in, in the actual stalking offence at clause one. Stalk stalking tends to be more premeditated and um, behaviour. So it does that you have actually you no, know, this this is something you have thought about that you have decided to you wanted to make contact with a person. Um, or follow them, or um, either follow them physically, or follow them through through the use of um, IT. Um, whereas being reckless, it's a it's a provision which is is which is found throughout the criminal justice system, and um, indeed even criminal damage, um, assault charges, in relation to um, where there, where's an element of intention, then the, the, the there's also normally an element of recklessness. Because it's not, it's not, a, it's not appropriate defence for somebody to say, "Well, I didn't intend this. I just didn't give any thought to this." Well, that that element of recklessness would capture that circumstances, so that they wouldn't. Otherwise, you would have a situation where somebody says, "Well, I never." They give evidence. Say, I never intended this. I never thought anything about this. It's never entered my mind. Um, um, it could be argued then that they have a potential defence, whereas if it's, if it's the elements of the offence also do recklessness, then that's not open to them. Okay, yeah, I, I get that. Well, just on down that clause then, it talks about the behaviour consisting of a single act mm -hmm. or a course of conduct. Yes. Can, can you think anywhere in your mind where a course of conduct couldn't be classified as stalking? <laughs> You see what I'm getting at there? Surely, a, if there's a course of conduct that should be the stalking offence, one or more incidents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I don't understand why then they've concluded a course. Now, maybe it's just a catch-all. Maybe they're just I think, trying. I to... think that really is the intention of of the drafters to have a catch-all situation. Um, yes. obviously, where where, it's, where it is a um, there's more than two. There's more than one element of um, or there's more than one incident. Then I would expect stalking to be the main charge brought. Yeah. yeah, just just another uh, question then away from clause two. You know, yeah, uh, that's me exhausted in clause two. The the issue that we talked about earlier around someone using an intermediary uh, or or a third party to stalk, whether that be a child unintentionally or, or with the child not knowing uh, the intention, or a, another family member, or even somebody in in your employ. Uh, where you would send someone to spy or stalk someone on your well, behalf. Okay. How, well, obviously, if they're, not, if they're an adult, they really should use their own judgment, given the circumstances. Um, it certainly wouldn't be a normal um, direction from an employer to an employee, unless they worked in surveillance or, you know, or were private investigation. Um, I'm thinking of but obviously the legislation allows provisions for the prevention of and um, for investigation and prevention of crime um, and there's also the element of the overall protection it has to be reasonable um, mm -hmm. in the circumstances and that now that defense 
can apply for like if a parent or a guardian who's concerned about a young adult uh, possibly yeah. but, um, who's vulnerable and they may i mean whenever my son was younger um at sitting school i just wanted to make sure i knew where he was so i had phone the phone app and uh, phone tracking um because he might have always told me where he was at the time but um, that's not the case now thankfully he's 23 so coming he has started to put a, a, a device on your phone now to make sure he knows where you are. That's normally <laughs> that's normally to pay for things. <laughs> but you, can, you understand where we're going here because yes. this committee did a lot of work on the child in the domestic violence setting, yes. uh, the use of the child, the threat to the child without the child even knowing about it. Uh, but if we were to put that third part, if we were to put a clause in this bill about a third party, a third person uh, being used. You probably would have to go into the realms of, of what you've just said, whereby someone could uh, could ask someone else to spy or stalk, and and straight away you think of a private investigator. Yes. Uh, so so how do you how do you make sure you you protect the victim with uh, against a third party stalker? Okay. Or an intermediary. Uh, but yes. Yeah. You would imagine a third party situation would be quite rare in the circumstances because the person if they're a law-abiding person, if they're given the direction which they feel is a, a breach of the criminal law, they would report, they would one, refuse to do it, and they would possibly report the, the client. Um, mm -hmm. So they would, and to obviously to, to the authorities. But the third party situation is one which it obviously is possible to be abused, and, and the person can unknowingly become involved in a, stalk, in a stalking um, situation. Yeah. Um, so you, you imagine there, let's take, for instance, my trade. I was a, I was a, uh, uh, electrician by trade. So if I sent my apprentice around to, um, uh, my next partner's house to keep an eye, who would be stalking there? Would that be me that would be guilty or my apprentice? Both. It would be a joint, it would be a joint enterprise situation. Right. Okay. Because if you were telling them to keep an eye on her, that obviously is outside his employment, his trade and it would fall under joint enterprise. Both of would be liable for prosecution. Uh, just, just to clarify, I didn't do any of that sort of behaviour when I was in the tools, right? Yeah, I'm uh, glad to hear it. That's me, Chair. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Brian. Brian, um, listening to your, well, reading your submission and, and listening to your presentation of it, I, I suppose I want to ask, and I have great concerns, because I think it is important that we pin down and widen out the piece around online activity as broadly as we can. Yes. But is there a danger, Brian, that young people, and you referenced the age of 10, yes. people as young as the age of 10 may have behaviours online that would constitute stalking and therefore could be brought forward on that? Yes, they, they could be brought forward on this um, in the youth court. Now, I, I, I do have personal issues in respect of the age of criminal responsibility. Mm -hmm. I do think it's too low in this jurisdiction, but that's a different argument. Um, in relation to, to young people, um, they, they, are, they are criminally responsible from the age of 10 upwards in this jurisdiction, so um, they can be liable and for their behaviours. Obviously, the Youth Justice Agency would be involved, and you would like to, if if the act was if the act's been proven, if they're satisfied that the act's been proven, and uh, the young person's carried out, um, then you would like to think that they would work with that young person for in relation to, to diversion, to avoid um, a conviction in the court. Thanks, Brian. I fully agree with that. Um, but I suppose what I'm really mindful of is in terms of this legislation and how it's set apart from other legislation that we have, it is really looking into the online world. And yeah. that's where most of those young people are. And, yeah. you know, you talked about um, behaviour being reckless and maybe that wasn't their intention and all of those possible defences. But I, I, I'm i really wondering, is, should there be something on the face of the bill? And, I'd, you know, I, I agree with you about um, the age of criminality. But should there be some type of safeguard, not just for the, the, the child's behaviour, because obviously the educational piece should reach out and teach them what 
good online behaviour looks like, but it could be that they're, you know, at that age when you do have an idol or, a, you know, be that, um, I don't know, a, a YouTuber or a singer or whatever, you know, that, that their behaviour technically on the face of it might fit stalking. Um, and, you know, understanding that grey area in between and also recognising the fact that the child, a child at that age, as Paul referred to, may actually be in the act of stalking, but they may be commissioned to do that by another person. And how do we separate that out? Um, so I'm really concerned that it's not, you know, that we could be loading this um, in, 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 a, in a way that's really going to be detrimental to young people. So your thoughts there would be appreciated. I, I don't think a young person, if, if they were totally innocent of the situation and they thought that, they, you know, they were acting on, on behalf of a parent who was asking to say, can you go around for a message for somebody or can you call them? And I remember a child, my mum would have sent me to neighbours for, for particular um, circumstances and whatever. Um, I don't think that, that they would they would be prosecuted under the circumstances, unless there was unless there were there was evidence that they they were aware. Obviously, the older they are, um, the, you know, then that that becomes a, an increased issue. Um, as in relation to young, I think it really is so important the education work that we carried out in schools and using uh, organisations like the youth to work one to one with young people. Um, where they where they deem with the risk, then they tailor um for the specific young people to to educate them relate to the risk of their behaviour. Um because nobody wants a young person to be prosecuted. Um uh, for some obviously the victims have to be prosecuted. But something I mean, whenever the sexual offence legislation was brought in the register, I've been on the wall for twenty six years. I have to say that are very mindful of being placed on the register, and that is the one thing that they will try to avoid all, at all circumstances. In addition to, and as you said, the more more parents than being sent to custody. So, and obviously there will there are notification requirements with the legislation as well, um, which I think is similar um, deterrent for young people or anybody committing these offences. But I don't, uh, because because the young people are involved in the age, got in from the age of responsibilities in the age of ten. I don't think this legislation they rely on adults um, as you know as being prosecuted. Young Thank people, you, Brian. Young people will undoubtedly un fall into. It. Mm. That's why um, yeah. I would ask you. To, I would obviously ask you, uh, legislators, your colleagues throughout, so there's a comprehensive. Um, all inclusive approach within the Department of Education Health and obviously the Department of Justice. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Brian. Um, more than happy to speak to you about minimum wage criminal responsibility at any time. Uh, Favourite topic of mine. Um, hopefully, we can have some movement on that at some point. But um, no, certainly um, uh, would have equal concerns on this um, and any offence that we are putting through a new legislation on the impact on children and young people from the age of 10. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that there for another time. Um, a couple of questions that I wanted to ask have already been asked, but I just want to pick up on something that was in your submission on page three. Yes. And it was about the provision for an NI resident living outside the jurisdiction engaging in this type of behaviour. Um, now, the PSNI had raised concern with this as well and their powers in relation to residents and non residents, especially over the internet. Yes. Um, with the use of IP addresses and so on. Now, you had mentioned in the submission of like, the limited application. However, that remains to be seen. I was just wondering, um, is, is that limited in terms of application with regard to any particular type of behaviour? Are you talking about maybe online there or is that um, limited in general? I think that's limited in general, but it is. it really is going to fall. That's sort of defending from people who live outside the jurisdiction um, who are dealing with who are victimising people who go to resident in Northern Ireland. It's going to be online, it's going to be cyber abuse. 
So and obviously the PSNI and the justice authorities have responsibility to, to protect people in this jurisdiction and it's just giving them another power uh, in order to do that uh, because there can be, people can reside in different jurisdictions um, and obviously if an offence um, if an offence is committed then it's up to the the PSNI and the PPS to seek extradition of somebody um, from another jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, that, that's good to get that uh, clarified. I had another question on hybrid, but Linda has answered that or asked that. Um, in terms of um, another thing you said about in clause eight about the issue of proportionality, um, and that's with the accused right to work, attend education or practice religion is seen as entirely proportionate. Um, what would what would you say on that just in terms of the stalking behaviour was taking place at work in education or at a religious setting? Well, it would really depend on, on I mean, the school, in relation to students, the school would have, would have to put in place um, conditions um, to ensure that the you know, behaviour isn't repeated, that the person who's the victim isn't put in any further distress. Um, as the, now, in relation to the workplace, also the employers would have would have a legal responsibility to ensure the well-being and the health and safety because this would fall under health and safety legislation. Um, for for their employees, they have a duty towards both. But if an offender, and um, a lot of um, employment certainly in the public sector, it would be if a person convicted of a criminal offence, they would have a duty of disclosure to their to their employer, depending on their contract. And that may lead to internal disciplinary matters, which, depending on the circumstances, can lead to, to, to dismissal. Now, as far as, now, it's more difficult for a tenant in relation to attendance at religious, at religious venues because there's no formal contract there um, between, the, between the parties. But again, the, the organisation who runs the religious institution would have to take steps and it may have it may have to bar the person who's who's deemed to be the offender if they're convicted. Okay, so it would be up to the relevant organisation then or business to rather than having anything with because the legislation obviously does have sort of an exemption then, you know, in terms of protection orders and so on. It would be up to then responsibility would go on to the say private business or the church. Well, yes, that could yes, but um, but if there's a prosecution, then it's up to, and also it's up to the chief constable uh, through the PSNI to make an application for a stalking prevention order, and the judge dealing with that, um, they would have to weigh up the, the, the specific circumstances, and they could they could put prohibitions in place and also put in um, conditions where the person has has to go obviously seek assistance and help through the probation service or any other service so they don't repeat this sort of behaviour in the future. But it's a balancing factor and every case will depend on, on individual circumstances. No, absolutely. I appreciate that. I'm just trying to get through if I have exemptions on the basis of legislation to do with, and I appreciate why that's there, I absolutely do, but we have a, we have a situation where someone is being the victim of stalking behaviour at those places yes. and they are exempt on the face of the legislation from no, the having... Judge, the, ju the judge has to decide, the judge really will have to decide, it's, if it's question, I mean it's a question of degree, um, I mean st stalking covers such a wide area. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have you can have a stalking with, where there's only you know, maybe one or two incidents, or sorry, two incidents. Whereas you can have uh, in the, the Matlis case, twenty five years, mm -hmm. hundreds of incidents, maybe thousands of incidents over a period of time. So there are two extremes where the mm -hmm. legislation is, is is trying to cover. Okay, thank you. No, that's that's all for me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Well, uh, I think that is. All of the members um, that had wanted to come in. So, Brian, can I thank you very much for taking the time with the committee today? That's much appreciated. Yes, thank you. Welcome, and thank you. As I say, it's a privilege to um, get the evidence before you. And I really, and the society uh, obviously appreciates it. And if there's anything, if you want to have any follow up um, queries, you can obviously contact the Law Society and we'll, we're happy to provide any information that you seek. Super. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Okay, members, item nine. The protection from the stalking bill. Uh, it's the final oral evidence session um, today, and uh, by no means least, of course, uh, the Women's Policy Group. 
NI representing a range of groups in the women's sector and the LGBTQI plus sector organisations are joining us via the Starleaf uh, facility. There's a copy of the written submission from the organisations in the meeting pack. Uh, the representatives have also supplied some PowerPoint slides to summarise the primary research that's been undertaken by the group on the experiences of victims of stalking in Northern Ireland and their opinions on how they could be better protected. They, this research informed the written submission to the committee and the slides are in your table pack at pages 7 to, to 32. So hopefully I'm able to uh, properly welcome uh, Rachel Paul, the Women's Sector Lobbyist, and Elaine Crory, representative from the Women's Resource and Development Agency. You're both very welcome to a meeting of the Justice Committee, and we will report this by Hansard, and we'll publish then a transcript of the evidence on our committee web page. So can I hand over to yourselves at this stage to give us a, an overview, and then we'll follow that up with some questions. Thank you. Yep, thank you so much. Um, I am going to attempt to share a screen here. Hopefully that will be okay. Yeah. Can you see that okay? Yep, that's came up. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, my name is Rachel Powell. I'm the Women's Sector Lobbyist uh, in the Women's Resource and Development Agency, and I also chair the Women's Policy Group. And I'm joined by Elaine Clory. Um, so I'm just going to let Elaine introduce herself before I go on. Hello, I'm Elaine Quarry. I work at the Women's Resource and Development Agency too, um, and also on the Raise Your Voice Project, which is one of the organisations involved in this submission. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, so the Women's Policy Group, for those that don't know, uh, this is a platform for women working in policy and advocacy roles in different organisations across Northern Ireland. And we share our work and speak with a collective voice on key issues. So it's made up of women from trade unions, grassroots women's organisations, women's networks, feminist campaigning organisations, uh, a wide variety of LGBT organisations, migrant groups, service support providers, NGOs, human rights and equality organisations and individuals. So we do have quite a broad range of expertise on a range of different matters. Um, so the Women's Resource and Development Agency was invited to submit evidence to the Justice Committee and because WRDA is the Secretariat, for both the policy group uh, and also the lead partner of the Raise Your Voice project. Um, this is why we decided it would be best to do a joint submission uh, alongside a number of other women in our sector that we work closely with. So I'm going to just move on. So uh, we submitted um, this comprehensive evidence response to the um, consultation back on the 16th of April. Um, it was a joint, joint evidence submission a collaborative piece really between a number of different organizations that were involved in the women's policy group um, specifically wrda raise your voice the women's ed federation northern ireland alliance for choice here and i cara friend transgender and i northern ireland women's european platform web crisis northern ireland and the women's support network a number of those organizations also submitted their own consultation response and all of these collectively have a substantial experience in matters related to women lgbtq plus people um, and on the issues of violence against women and girls and gender-based violence generally um, so what we're submitting today is on behalf of both uh, wrda and the women's policy group uh, as a collective uh, so, given the prevalence and seriousness of stalking in our society and the lack of Northern Ireland specific data on the prevalence of stalking, we decided it would be appropriate to conduct our own primary research as we really wanted to support the evidence submission and ensure that the voices and lived experiences of victims uh, were central to the development of a robust protection from stalking bill. So the Women's Policy Group and Raise Your Voice and our collective members we put out a call for evidence on the 30th of March, 2021, um, and we created an online survey asking people to anonymously submit their experiences of stalking uh, and also their opinions on how they could be better protected. So this evidence was shared widely across the broad voluntary and community sector. And we had to close this then on Tuesday, the 13th of April. Now we would normally like to have our surveys open for a longer period of time, but I'm sure as everyone on this committee will appreciate, there has been an unprecedented level of public consultation and evidence submission. So um, we would have liked to have had it open for longer, but nonetheless, we still received 
38 responses from victims and survivors in Northern Ireland, and this was some of the first research of this kind in Northern Ireland. So um, in terms of what we were asking people to submit evidence on, we included a range of both qualitative and quantitative questions uh, for respondents, and we allowed them to answer anonymously, and we also allowed them to uh, leave questions out if they chose, none of them were compulsory. And then it, we finished up with signposting to support services for anybody who would need them. The questions that were included should be on your screen, I believe. Um, they asked questions like, uh, demographic information, uh, people's um, status in terms of whether they were uh, their gender or their gender identity, um, their disability status, their ethnicity and so on. We also asked people, how many times have, be have you been a victim of stalking? Was your stalker known to you? If you wish, please detail your stalking experience or experiences. Uh, did you report any stalking incident that you experienced? And if you reported to whom did you report it? Uh, if you reported, was the response helpful and why? Um, are you aware of the domestic violence disclosure scheme or CARES law? And if so, was it useful to you um, or your care? And then did, did the stalking happen online in real life or both? And then how did the stalking end? Please describe anything you wanted to tell us. And what would have made you feel safer? And what do you think might stop someone from stalking or harassing somebody? And then finally, if you wish, tell us the impact that the stalking had on you. Can I just double check that the slides are moving on for everyone else and it's not just on my screen? Are they not moving on? No, no, they're not. Oh, let me see. I wonder maybe if one of the clerks will be able to share it or, because it's moving on on my end, but not for yourselves. Yeah. We do have them in our table pack, Rachel, so we are we are able to follow it um, through our own electronic devices if you if it doesn't work on the this kind of screen that you have for us to broadcast. So um, we are following it on our own electronic devices. Great. Um, well, can I just check? Can you see the screen yep. now? Yep. Key findings. And is it on demographics? Yep, it's up. Yep. Okay. Just to test, does this move to the next slide then? Let's see. No, I'm going to just stop screen share then, and we can just provide this evidence orally because you have it in your packs. Great. Thank you. Um, so basically then, to summarize the demographics of the respondents uh, to our survey, 92% uh, identified as female, 5.2% as male, 2.6% as non-binary, 18.4% uh, as LGBTQ+, 21% uh, as disabled, and 2.63% as being from an ethnic minority background. So while this was an open call for evidence, we received responses from a wide range of intersectional identities and protected characteristics. And the prevalence of stalking towards women, the LGBT community, and in particular, disabled women uh, was concerning given the level of population size. We also received uh, two responses from people who did not identify as female, with one being male and one being non-binary. Um, and we were able to work out based on the responses that 97.4% of the cases disclosed to us involved a male perpetrator and 5.26% of cases disclosed involved a female perpetrator. So um, following on from that, uh, when we asked the question, how many times have you been a victim of stalking? In, in these responses, the majority of respondents preferred or seemed to understand it as asking how many different people have stalked them rather than how many individual instances of stalking did you experience? Um, so we explored it um, more through the qualitative responses that come later. Uh, crucially, 554 percent of respondents were said that they, they were victims of stalking more than once, meaning by more than one person. And that really highlights the prevalence of this issue. The fact that people can fall victim to this crime more than once in their lives might be indicative of the fact that once people experience it and recognize it for what it is, then they will recognize it should it happen again later in their lives. Um, so that's 44.7 percent said once, but then everybody else said twice up to five times or up to 10 times. So that's individual perpetrators rather than incidents. So when we asked respondents whether their stalker was known to them, 71.1% said yes, they knew their stalker well. 
and 13.2% said yes, they knew them as an acquaintance or a friend of a friend. Um, 0% of respondents only knew them online uh, and 21% of respondents didn't know their stalker at all. This is of great significance to us because there are often a lot of myths around stalking that it only really happens to famous people uh, or that it's done by some random stranger. Stalkers more often than not target somebody they know, either an ex-partner, classmate, colleague and so on. And we found that in total 84.3% of our respondents were stalked by someone they knew compared to 21.1% who did not know their stalker at all. Uh, for those who knew their stalker well, uh, generally it was because they were in a previous relationship with them and more often than not it was one that ended in abuse. Many of the others had an acquaintance with the perpetrator through school, university, work or socialising and often described their stalker as pursuing them for a romantic relationship uh, in which they were not interested in. This was the motivation in most of the cases that were reported to us where the person did not know the stalker either. So the next question was, if you wish to please detail your stalking experiences. And as you can imagine, there was a wide variety of different responses to this. The vast majority of respondents disclosed in this question their relationship to their stalker. Um, so 79% said that they, uh, their stalker was an ex-partner or someone they had previously dated, even if only for a short time. About 23.7% referenced being stalked by an acquaintance, a friend of a friend. 10.5% referenced being stalked at school or by someone they knew from school, even if that was several years previously. 18.4% referenced being stalked by a stranger or a random person. 26 by an employer and 26 by a colleague. Uh, so in addition to this, 52.6% of respondents referenced being stalked at their home. 31.6% at their workplace. 105 at their school or university. And worryingly, 47.4% of the respondents responded, uh, told us about being physically followed by their stalker, with 23.7% of those being followed by car. Um, several respondents also experienced unwanted phone calls, texts or emails, that's nearly half at 47.4. Online harassment, that's 21.1. .1. And unwanted gifts, which is 7.9%. 10.5% of the respondents also mentioned concerns about the unstable mental health of their stalkers and references to ex-partners threatening suicide as well. The most universal theme in all of these experiences was the serious long-term impact on the survivors of this stalking behaviour. 100% of the respondents listed long-term impacts on their mental health because of their experiences. Um, from those cases where the harassment was ongoing and ones where it had ended decades before. Uh, three percent, uh, sorry, three respondents specifically mentioned that they are living now with PTSD as a result of this experience. And some of them feared for their physical safety and others had suffered damage to their career or their academic career. Other key themes included the coexistence of in-person and digital stalking, the prevalence of individuals experiencing stalking by more than one perpetrator, the rise of image-based sexual abuse, sometimes called IPSA or revenge porn, the connection between perpetrators' perceived sense of entitlement and their behaviour and how the gaps in the law uh, before this enabled that, and then confusion over how best to deal with the issue. and. Um, a really wide variety of responses uh, from various institutions that they might have reported to, including the police, the justice system, if it got that far, educational establishments and workplaces in terms of putting protections in place. So we asked participants whether they reported the stalking incidents that they experienced, and it was roughly half and half. So 52.6% said yes, they did report it, with 47.3% saying no, they didn't. But when we asked them who they reported this to, whether that was the police, employers, teachers, workplaces, and so on, 42.1% uh, reported to the police. Uh, and then after this, close to 8% to family, friends, and neighbours, close to 8% reported to their employers. And then it gradually gets uh, lower in number where they've reported it to women's aid or other support providers, to their GP, to a solicitor, to their university, um, or even reaching out to the perpetrator's family to ask for help in preventing this behaviour. Um, another uh, key theme on, on the issue of reporting is Elaine, um, some uh, of Elaine, if I can just jump in here at this stage, sorry Rachel and Elaine, can I just check, are, are you planning to go through every slide that you have provided to us? Uh, 
Um, no, we have a condensed version that we're using for today, so I don't think that has been included in your packs. So we're going to finish up on the results and then just some key recommendations. Okay, because we at around 10-15 minutes just for the initial overview and then we'll go into questions. And obviously we have the details of all of the slides. That forms the evidence that we will have got. Um, and I'm just keen that we can try and get into having a wider discussion around that. So if, if you were able to bring your um, presentation to a close shortly, just to allow us to, to get on with the, the business, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, yeah. so just very briefly, um, there were reports about it, people reported it police or other agencies quite late into the behaviour um, for various reasons and then employers tend to put practical supports in place at higher rates than universities um, and on the issue of um, the domestic violence disclosure scheme or CARES law um, this is really alarming outcome um, about 52 percent of respondents said yes that they were aware of it and nearly as many 48 percent nearly said no um, and a lot of them found it very unhelpful, 0% said it was helpful, 100% said it wasn't useful, sometimes because they weren't aware of it or because their stalking conceded that coming into place, um, but the others because they found that the provisions of that scheme weren't in any way helpful for um, stopping or preventing that abuse. So some of the, the key findings and key recommendations then that we have made is in relation to, first of all, understanding the connection between paramilitary involvement and how this enhances gender-based violence in Northern Ireland, as this was a recurring theme coming through our research. Um, a lot as well around the growing ways in which perpetrators are using creative technologies to uh, stalk and continue to harass their victims, including financial abuse, logging into banking apps, uh, deep fakes where they're photoshopping uh, the faces of their victims onto other images, and even so far as an employer using an employee's uh, personal details and downloading images of them uh, and threatening to out them. So there have been a lot of different challenges that have come through and some that aren't necessarily covered uh, by the bill that we would like the Justice Committee to consider. Uh, we also wanted the Justice Committee to consider some of the unique forms of abuse by different minority groups and the high prevalence between, for example, honour-based abuse and harm uh, and the connection of this in stalking and also how LGBT women in particular face unique forms of abuse and disabled women. So in general, then, we have made some recommendations in relation to myth busting on stalking, uh, really on the connection between stalking and domestic abuse and how this cannot be separated uh, and crucially the gendered nature of this crime and how it is quite often rooted uh, in attitudes of misogyny and entitlement over women's affection. Um, and related to that, the final thing I'll say is um, what we would like to see more of in this is preventative steps to um, avoid this becoming as broad an issue, as big an issue as it is. Um, Recidivism is a serious problem in this area, um, and that's not based on Northern Ireland statistics because we have no Northern Ireland statistics, but worldwide it is. Um, and we would like to see more preventative measures taken around education, not just uh, obviously essential for the PSNI um, and uh, other agencies that might be dealing with these crimes, but also for the general public so that people understand what it is and why it is wrong um, and what we can do to undermine that sense of entitlement that so often motivates us. One final thing just to mention is given the prevalence of stalking on people's workplaces, we also really would like to stress the need for guidance for employers, but also educational institutions, particularly as the response from universities uh, was quite poor in our research. And that we would really stress that the gendered nature of this crime should be recognized in line with international mechanisms such as CEDAW, the Istanbul Convention, uh, and also ILO on tackling gender-based violence in the workplace. Okay, thank, thank you um, for that. And we do really appreciate the extent of the research that's been carried out and it'll be something that we will be able to draw upon. You touched upon, I think, Rachel, the, you had mentioned the, the honour-based abuse, and it was part of your submission when I was looking through. I was keen just to explore a little bit with you um, in, in terms of that. Do, do you want to just pick up on the kind of nuances between the honour-based abuse and how that could relate to stalking? And is, is that something that you have picked up in terms of prevalence in Northern Ireland? 
Yes, so uh, we had different members of the women's policy group who work with women from various ethnic minority and religious minority groups come forward to us and talk about ongoing cases where they are seeing women uh, being victims of stalking connected to motivations behind honour-based abuse. So I think it's a, an issue that isn't widely understood in Northern Ireland, and I think it's something that is deeply connected to all of our measures to tackle gender-based violence. And we did make some recommendations on uh, engaging with groups who support victims of honour-based abuse. So um, there are different groups working, such as the Belfast Multicultural Association and women working with Belfast Islam Islamic Centre, who in particular are experts in this area. So it was really distressed that to understand the nuance of this and the motivations behind it, that we would recommend the committee uh, engages with women from these sort of organisations um, and really understanding how the misguided sense of ownership and entitlement that is involved in a lot of stalking cases can sometimes be exacerbated in terms of honour-based abuse uh, and supported as well. Okay, thank you. And then just one more from me. In terms of um, the new legislation in Ireland that's known as Coco's Law, um, is that something that we could do with in Northern Ireland as well? Uh, yes, I really think that it is. Um, it's the kind of thing that um, we're a little slow on the uptake on this, and I suppose a lot of other jurisdictions are too, because technology can often move faster than laws can keep up with. Um, but certainly it is something that would be useful. Um, there's serious damage that can be caused by what we call IPSA and is often known as revenge porn and any legislation that we can put in place to protect victims of that would be really useful. It's, and also it's worth looking at what's going on in the Republic of Ireland and in other jurisdictions nearby because these things can cross borders so easily. And there was an instance um, last winter where a large database was being collated, I suppose, of intimate images, and that was happening south of the border in that jurisdiction, but it involved images of women from all over the island. So it's one of those things where working in, in uh, communication with other jurisdictions would be really useful. Okay. And just you. to stress on that as well, I, I think that it should be connected to broader RSE education, because I, I noticed in the, the last presentation there were discussions around young people being involved uh, in these sort of crimes and I do think as technology advances we really need to be educating our young people on the harm uh, of deep fakes and revenge porn uh, and all of these other issues that are growing and we do recognise that a lot of the legislation to deal with social media in particular is UK wide. Um, there needs to be widespread reform and we've made these recommendations in relation to hate crime um, and all forms of online abuse. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me just bring in some members then. Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to both Elaine and Rachel for your presentation. And I suppose I'm going to try and, and stick to just the stuff around the stocking bill, but the, there's some brilliant stuff in, in that presentation that we should be picking up on separately as well. Um, not least the, the stuff around the women and girls, violence against women and girls strategy, and we need to see that moving forward. But um, just in relation to... Um, the suggested amendment to clause 14 around the notification requirements you know the recurring themes are, are, and are, resource, are resourcing and training can, can you just give me a wee bit more detail around that, that amendment really or um. So yes, I can start on that um, and then Elaine can probably come in. So we were making recommendations that we also made in a recent consultation on domestic abuse protection orders and notices. Yeah. And basically um, this was just suggested that we should be expanding this and requiring the name and other names they would be known as their current address and last address if it's less mm -hmm. than three months, if they're currently in a relationship and if so, the name of the person, um, any children or other people living at the property um, and other information in relation to addictions and poor mental health um, because of the escalation that can happen. So we basically wanted to recommend this to ensure that the stalker couldn't continue to stalk the victim under a different name or by changing their address so that they couldn't be found by the police uh, and that the failure to notify the police of any of those uh, bits of information uh, would result in a violation of or a breach of the SPO. Um, so we were taking our guidance here from other organizations who deal with similar protection orders and 
even in the evidence that we were receiving, there was a lot of women telling us about partners who moved house, but we couldn't find out where, but they were still finding them. And we just think it needs to be more robust. So I don't know, Elaine, if you want to mention anything around uh, the clause. Um, nothing uh, extra except that this relates to our the approach we take in general when we're talking about um, the kind of protections that need to be in place is a joined up kind of one. Mm -hmm. So understanding the connections between stalking and domestic abuse um, that does not have full overlap but there's a strong link means that we, the kind of protections you put in place for one should be extended mm -hmm. to the other where at all possible and relevant. Um, so that's why we have almost the same recommendations in, in domestic abuse um, in terms of new domestic abuse law because um, the same kinds of loopholes are known and the same kinds of protections need to be put in place. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. And um, Chair, I think that is something we should certainly raise with the, the department um, and look at as a committee as well. Just, you've already alluded to the, the feedback in relation to the existing domestic violence uh, disclosure, Claire's Law, and that so many people are unaware of the scheme. Um, you know, and find it un unhelpful, talk too long, that there's um, not enough follow-up support. Um, can we also, Chair, maybe ask, speak to the department in relation to that uh, and just maybe forward that particular section of this? I know it's not directly um, linked to the stocking bill, but I do think that it has a link and it is important. And just ask, what are the department's intentions around you know, addressing that, I suppose. Is, but there's no point in it. It's the same stuff that we're saying about this particular legislation. Legislation is no good if it's no, not effective and if it's not used properly. So could we maybe just highlight that? And, and you know, is there a potential for what the recommendations in the update and, and a relaunch of the campaign? But I think we need to find out what the department's um, plans are to address that, given that there, there now is evidence that it is not having the desired effect and we have put a lot of focus on the domestic abuse bill and will on this one to make sure that legislation is effective so if there's you were going to say something early and sorry I was just going to add, because um, that was one of the most um, alarming findings of, of this research for me um, 100% found it unhelpful and one of the things that has come up a lot and it's, it's detailed in our longer response is um, you know after a relationship has ended the scheme no longer really applies. Uh, you have to be in a continuing relationship with the person in order to find out any relevant information. Um, and the, the, they obviously the disclosure itself is limited for all sorts of data protection and, and privacy reasons, but it often gives people enough to know they should be worried, but not enough to know what they should exactly be worried about. Mm -hmm. And obviously the police's hands are tied to some degree, um, but I, I think a, a really robust look at how that works in practice would definitely be valuable uh, for victims of domestic abuse, stalking and any mm -hmm. other uh, related crime where, where um, the scheme might be relevant. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's important that we, we highlight that with the department as a even as a separate issue and, and forward that that section of the presentation. No, listen, the, the presentation has been very fulsome, so there, is, there isn't a lot of questions to ask, to be fair. So um, just to say thank you, and it is appreciated and it's very helpful in terms of our, our ongoing work around the bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Linda, and we'll take note of that in terms of raising things with the, with the department. Could I bring in Shania Bradley, please, and then Rachel Woods? Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Rachel and Elaine. To be fair, you have covered this, and I, and I know it's in your written submission, but I see that you did raise it, and you mentioned it there, Rachel, about the RSE part um, and the age profile of some of these um, Offences. So the the only other piece I maybe wanted to go back to at the start, you talked about the definition of stalking not being there, and uh, and I, I'm not going to go over because your your submission is um, quite detailed on that, and you did reference, I suppose, having to keep the breadth there for things like, and you mentioned drones, for example. You know that there's things that you, you know we couldn't we can't have a account for everything. So. So yeah, are you content and the way that is at the moment, or do you think it needs a direct intervention to to keep it open? Well, our recommendation was was really that in the list of behaviours associated with stalking to ensure that there is 
uh, explicit mention of this list is not exhaustive. And we think that that is particularly important because of technological advancements mm -hmm. uh, and new ways of perpetrators harassing victims uh, and finding ways that you couldn't possibly think will be possible uh, and, and use this against them. So I think so long as there's the flexibility and also the option to continuously review the bill um, so that if we are coming across new forms of evidence on how other ways of stalking are happening, that that can be accounted for in the bill in the future. Okay, I take that on board because I, I did wonder, it is worth pu pulling out, Rachel, I just wondered if it's a stylistic thing, you know, in terms of the drafters or, you know, if it's not stated, can it not be presumed? So it's certainly worth exploring further, but thank you. Thank you to both. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Rachel Woods, please. See if the spotlight can bring in Rachel. Oh. I think technology has <laughs> produced a, a little technical glitch for us. She'll maybe come back in here in a second. Well, listen, apologies for that, um, but Rachel and Elaine, can I thank you both very much for, for joining with us and for your submission. Um, it's very much appreciated, so thank you. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, folks, that's unfortunate just the way that worked with Rachel at the end, um, but we'll move on to the next item of the agenda then. Obviously, issues that were raised will be collated. We will action that um, as well in terms of all of those evidence sessions but um, thank you members for your patience today with all of those oral evidence sessions so if i can take us to agenda item 13 the department is proposing to make a statutory rule which will be subject to the negative resolution procedure to amend the prescribed list of bodies that the police can share information with for the purposes of providing support services the purpose of the rule is to add the new advocacy support service for victims of domestic and sexual abuse, which is called Assist NI, and that will be provided by the Belfast and Lisburn Women's Aid in partnership with FOIL Women's Aid and Men's Advisory Project as a prescribed body with whom the PSNI can share relevant information about victims of domestic and sexual abuse crimes for advocacy support groups. Information will be shared solely for this purpose and protocols will be put in place to ensure information is passed securely, stored and deleted appropriately in line with GDPR requirements. So if members are content um, with the proposed statutory rule, then it will come forward in due course for formal consideration unless there's any more information needed. Then we can indicate our contentment and we'll deal with it in due course. Sure. Can yes. I just make one small point yes, on that? Yes. I'm very content to move on. But, you know, um, these are organisations that we as a committee have relied on heavily. And I welcome to see this because I think they're a very trusted partner. But also they've continually raised with us the issue of resourcing. And whilst I welcome them, I suppose, coming closer to the formal arrangements, I also think this should be on record followed up by them having ac adequate and routine access to funding because they're living hand to mouth at some point, you know, um, and I think that's unfair that we increase the what the expectations but don't always follow up with funding. I think it's wor worthy of noting. But thank you, Chair. Well, we can we can indicate some of that whenever we're going back to the department, and we will include that um, commentary, Sinead. So thank you. Okay, um, item 14 is the DOJ budget. It's the draft committee response. Um, following the oral briefing on the 29th of April on the department's 21-22 final budget settlement, the committee agreed a draft response would go to the committee for finance, summarising the key issues that we had discussed with officials and that that would be prepared for members' consideration. So I know that was um, circulated with members by way of a draft. And if members are content with that, then we will uh, issue that response to the committee for finance. Yeah, Linda. Yeah, I, I'm I'm content with that, Chair. Um, I I just wanted to raise something in relation to 
budget and I think is is Doug still on the meeting? No. He's, he's maybe went off the meeting, but there was there was an issue, um, an interview that Doug done this morning, and it was actually in relation to health, not justice. But when he was asked where he would take money from in order to put it into the health budget, he said that the separated prisoners regime would be the first place he would start. Now we have been repeatedly told in this committee by the minister, by the head of the prison service, by officials. I think it's been given in writing, orally, every possible way that the separated prison regime is paid for by the NIO, not out of the executive budget. Can we clarify that it is paid for by the NIO? So therefore, it is not something that we have access on this. There's something that Doug has a relationship with the NIO that the rest of us don't have. And if he does, I would urge him to ask them for some more money, please, for other issues, not least the victim's pension. But... I, I just think that it was disingenuous and it has been repeatedly addressed and in fairness to the, the head of the prison service and prison staff and I've been in McGabry, um I haven't been over the separated wing but I've been in McGabry and met with staff and they have been very clear in relation to the difficulties that it would create for them if we didn't have the separated regime Actively, they would have a separated regime, but it would be within the the wider um, population of the prison, and it would create difficulties for the staff as much as anybody else. And I just think that we need to really take this serious and and stop messing about with the issue. I know it's separate to the budget, but it is related in that we we shouldn't be disingenuous about where money comes from or where it can go to. I think we have to be honest with people. Chair, can I come in there just... Sure, sure. And then I'm going to move on because it's not related to this aspect of the no, item. No, but just, just on a point of accuracy, and I, I could be wrong, but my understanding is that it's the NIO, the Secretary of State, sorry, who makes decisions around separation. But it does come out of our justice budget. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but... Let's write and we'll just find out so that everyone has absolute clarity in terms of how the separated regime is funded, if that's from the NIO or if it's from the Department for, for Justice, um, and we, we will ask that question. In terms of the response that was provided then, we're content. Um, we'll submit that to the Committee for Finance and we'll forward it then to the Minister for Justice and the Assembly Research Service uh, for their information. Members agreed? Great. Great. Okay. Item 15 is the Digital Justice Strategy, the Progress Update, a written uh, paper. Committee considered the Department of Justice five-year Digital Justice Strategy at the meeting on the 9th of June uh, last year, requested further information on a range of issues and regular updates on progress against the priorities in the strategy. Committee subsequently noted the additional info at the meeting on the 10th of September last year. So the Department has now provided an update on progress to deliver the year one priority projects and advises that the Digital Justice Group is reviewing emerging digital priorities and the capacity within the system to develop and implement additional projects including pilot online dispute mechanisms for the Small Claims Court and uh, the potential to include additional organisations in the sharing of digital evidence electronically. So if members are content that we will note this update and again, if members are agreeable, we'll advise the department that the committee would wish to continue receiving regular updates on progress and information to any changes or additions that are made to the strategy. Members agreed with that? Agreed. agreed. Item 16. The department is proposing to undertake a consultation from the 1st of June through to the 24th of September on the proposed introduction of standard legal aid fees for solicitors in proceedings in relation to Article 8 and Article 50 applications under the uh, Children Order 1995 in the Family Proceedings Court. An escape mechanism will be available to uh, remunerate those cases which are particularly complex or lengthy and exceed the cost threshold. A separate questionnaire specifically aimed at collecting qualitative data from solicitor solicitors will issue and then run in parallel to this consultation. The proposals are being driven by the recommendations in the Access to Justice Review and by the Public Accounts Committee um, and Comptroller and Auditor uh, General. So, members, it's for us um, to 
uh, note the proposed consultation and then we will consider the matter further when the results and proposed way forward are available. Members content to note at this stage? Yes, I, I'm, I'm content, Chair, other than just to say at this point that I'm going to keep an eye on this one. Uh, I think it's a very important consultation and the one that we should very much be minded to pick up once the consultation is over. Thank you. Okay, noted. Um, item 17, correspondence. Uh, let me just draw attention to a couple of items. Um, item 2 of the correspondence in the meeting pack, there's a response from DOJ to the committee's request for information on the planned actions to implement the outstanding recommendations highlighted in the Sajini report of the follow-up review on the implementation of recommendations in the thematic inspection of the handling of domestic violence and abuse cases by the criminal justice system. The Department has provided a table setting out the actions being taken in relation to each outstanding recommendation and included proposed timeframes where possible. The Department has not provided detail on the resources targeted towards implementation of uh, the recommendations. So if members are agreeable, we will again request the details of the resources that will be allocated that ensures actions to deliver these recommendations are progressed and we'll also request an update on progress to deliver the recommendations six months from now. Um, if members are content with that. Um, another item just is correspondence from DOJ to the committee uh, request for a response to conclusions and recommendations within the NI Affairs Committee report on cross-border cooperation on policing security and criminal justice after Brexit. Uh, while the Department has responded to the two particular areas highlighted by the Committee regarding loss of access to the uh, SIS2 and the PSNI proposal for a bespoke NI Centre of Excellence for Law Enforcement Cooperation and Coordination, it has not provided any specific details in respect of the other conclusions and recommendations. So again, members, we will go back to the Department asking uh, for the other conclusions and recommendations in the report in terms of how it will ensure that uh, Northern Ireland interests are recognised. Um, finally, for me on the items of correspondence, the Committee for Finance has requested the views of this committee by the 4th of June on the establishment of an independent fiscal council for Northern Ireland and the potential role and powers for such a council. If members are content, um, so members, in terms of considering these questions outlined in the letter, uh, if you were able to give that matter some thought or whether you're just going to leave it to your members on the finance committee um, to deal with that and um, that's perfectly fine otherwise if you can let the clerk know then a paper could be prepared for our meeting on the 3rd of June um, so if members are interested in providing that if you want to indicate uh, to Christine um, please do so are members content then that we action the remaining items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet Agreed. I don't have any business as chairman. Is there any other business members wish to raise? Sure. Yes, Linda. Can we, as a committee, um, I was actually going to raise it under correspondence because seventeen point two is in relation to it. But could we write to the minister and ask for a time frame around the justice bill? Um, I'm extremely concerned that it has not come to this committee. As of yet, there is is quite a substantial amount of stuff within that bill that we wanted to see addressed around Gillen and a number of other issues. Um, as far as I'm aware, the entire committee are agreed that we want the Justice Bill in front of us, un unless somebody wants to tell me differently. So I don't know what the blockage is within the executive, and I would urge anybody who does <laughs> to, to please use whatever influence they have to get it out of the executive and into the, the committee and onto the floor of the assembly because I, I, I want to see that coming forward. I mean, there, there certainly is stuff in it that's important to, to all of us that, and we've all repeatedly said that in committee and in the chamber. So I would like to see it coming forward. So if we can just write to the minister and, and ask her what's happening and what is the timeline. Yep. Happy to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other business then? If not, then our next meeting is Thursday 3rd of June, 2 p.m. So it'll be the afternoon session and that'll be in room 30 and via the Starleaf facility. Okay, members, thanks for your attendance. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed.